Hi and welcome to the Did You Know lecture. So typically in my courses, in one of the very first lectures, I give a little preview on one selected topic or aspect that uh, we will cover later in the course in more detail. So just to give you an impression how we will work and think in this course. And uh, now let's assume the following very common situation. So two investors uh, meet at the end of the year and uh, the first investor is very happy with uh, the performance of his stock portfolio. So he has read a lot of analyst reports and worked hard for it. And finally, he picked uh, the most promising stocks. And then at the end of the year, his portfolio value increased by 12%. And uh, he's very happy, but is 12% uh, uh, really good or bad? And it's actually impossible to say this uh, without comparing it to a benchmark. And uh, for example, it might be the case uh, that uh, we had a fantastic bull market throughout the year and uh, the broad, broad stock market increased by 18%. And in this case, uh, 12% is a really poor performance. And it would have been better to just invest in an ETF that tracks uh, a broad market index. So that's how it is. And uh, just to make it clear, I don't want to blame here stock picking and I don't want to say that passive investing is superior to active investing. So that's not true. But uh, the key message is here that it's all about proper performance measurement and uh, selecting the right benchmark for performance comparison. And uh, this reminds me of an analogy that I have heard when I was uh, in business school so it's actually not an analogy, it's a joke, a black humor joke, but uh, with uh, some true aspects. So two investment managers uh, meet for lunch break and uh, they are planning to take a walk in the forest. However, there are rumors uh, that a hungry bear is living in the forest. And after a brief discussion, uh, the two managers uh, decided to take the risk but uh, then when they entered uh, the forest, one manager started to change uh, the shoes from business shoes to running shoes. Now, the other manager was uh, surprised and said that uh, your shoes are useless. If the bear attacks, then he will be faster than you anyway. But then the other manager countered. So I agree, but it doesn't matter because uh, the shoes will allow me to run faster than you. So what we can learn here is uh, that in real life and uh, in particular in financial markets, it's all about performance measurement and in particular, it's all about selecting the right benchmark and otherwise uh, you will get in trouble with uh, the bear or the bear market. In this video, I have some tips for you how to get uh, the most out of this course and how to improve your Udemy experience. We are here in one of the videos and it might be the case that uh, something is not clear or you have a question or comment on that lecture and uh, therefore you can find here the Q&A button. And before writing a question, you should always uh, browse old questions as it uh, might be the case uh, that your question has already been answered. And if not, you can create here the new question, ask a new question and it's uh, actually best to describe your problem as detailed as possible. It is always helpful when students include a screenshot to give some helpful background information on their problem. And I'm actually best prepared to respond to your question quickly, so typically within uh, 24 hours. If you are not a native speaker or if you are more the visual learner, it might be useful to enable captions. And you can do this here and then you can go here to English. These are automated captions uh, that are far away from being perfect, but uh, they can be pretty helpful. And also you can customize uh, the captions here. And uh, for instance, uh, you can change uh, the font size to maybe 100. And let's go back here. And you can also display the captions uh, under the video. So there's some flexibility here. And finally, you can also open the full lectures uh, transcripts uh, here. And here you can go through the full lecture and uh, read what I'm saying here. So let's uh, go back again here. 
Students are different and for some students an instructor talk too fast or the pace of the course is uh, too fast. And at the same time for other students the same course is too slow. And this shouldn't be an issue here on Udemy as students can select their own speed. And uh, you can do this here. And uh, actually the speed of one is uh, the normal speed. But you can even slow down the speed to 0 0.75 or 0 0.5. And of course you can also speed up to 1.5 or even 2. And of course you can also pause the course at any time here. So feel free to experiment and find out your optimal speed. Sometimes it might be the case that you experience poor video quality. For instance this video here is completely blurred. And in 99% of all cases there's one reason for poor video quality and a blurred screen. It's actually the student's internet connection. Keep in mind that also the best and fastest internet connection can have slowdowns. In any case, your connection must support uh, the streaming of high quality videos as uh, the entire course has been screencasted in high definition video quality. So whenever you experience uh, low video quality, it's either the internet connection or in very few cases uh, problems on the Udemy server. In any case, please keep in mind that technical issues are typically beyond my control. So what can you do in these cases? Uh, maybe you can manage to find a closer location to your Wi-Fi router. And you can also manually adjust uh, the video quality and uh, you can do this here. So the reason why this video is blurred is uh, that I selected uh, the poorest uh, video quality setting, 144. And actually the best setting is uh, the auto setting that automatically adjusts quality depending on your internet connection. But uh, sometimes it uh, might be beneficial to turn off auto and select a lower quality setting manually. For instance 480 should still uh, deliver sufficient quality. So you can turn off your autoplay and select for example 480. So that's not perfect, but uh, I think it's uh, still sufficient here. And Udemy will ask you very early in the course for a review. Maybe after this or the next lecture. And uh, this might be appropriate for courses with a duration of 45 minutes or so. But in my view it's a nonsense for courses uh, like this one here with uh, 10, 20 or even more hours of uh, video content. And if I could, I would ask you for a review earliest after two hours or so. But uh, this is not in my discretion and I cannot control this. So if you get asked for an early review and if you think that uh, you haven't seen enough to give a well-founded uh, review, then uh, please click here on ask me later. Please do not click randomly on stars to get uh, rid of uh, this request here as it might negatively affect uh, the overall course rating. And as a direct consequence, it harms my ability to update the course and to create new content and also to answer your questions. So each review counts and I am thankful for each and every honest and uh, well-founded uh, review or feedback. So thanks in advance and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. Now let me give you a brief overview of the course contents and topics. So the course is structured in four parts and uh, part one introduces all basics and prerequisites uh, that you need for the other parts. So these are definitely must knows before you can continue with uh, parts uh, two to four. And uh, for example, we will introduce asset classes and uh, equity markets. And then we will define the uh, trading and investing. So these are two different things uh, with different objectives. And uh, you will learn how to load detailed stock data from the web with Python. So for example, historical prices, balance sheet ratios, valuation multiples and more. And then we will perform a very fast uh, data driven analysis. And then I will introduce interactive brokers and in particular API trading with interactive brokers. And at the end of part one, you will be able to create the first automated trading bots uh, with Python and uh, the interactive brokers API. Finally, I will introduce stock performance measurement and analysis. So you can only properly trade and invest if you can measure the performance of stocks and ETFs. 
Coming to part two of the course, so part two is all about ETF trading and equity portfolio investing. And uh, we will start uh, with the stock indices and uh, ETF trading. And uh, you will learn how to track or replicate an index on your own. And then next uh, we will create uh, our own new indices and also investment strategies from scratch. And uh, then we will also implement them with uh, the Interactive Brokers API. So these four topics are really practical and hands-on. And then we continue with two more theoretical but uh, very helpful topics. So portfolio theory, portfolio optimization and uh, assing pricing models. So that's part two. And then coming to part three, algorithmic trading with interactive brokers. And uh, we will cover several strategies like momentum strategies, contrarian strategies and strategies based on technical analysis and indicators. And then we will go through the full process of uh, algorithmic trading. So strategy backtesting, strategy optimization and implementation with Python and uh, interactive brokers. So first uh, with a paper trading account and then with a live account. And finally, we'll also cover multiple ticker or multiple instrument uh, trading strategies, which is actually pretty simple with uh, the interactive brokers API. So the first uh, three parts form the core of the course, but then there will be part four with uh, some advanced uh, VIP topics like advanced data sources, advanced uh, strategies and more. And as always, I will also create additional content based on frequent uh, student requests. And to, to sum up, you should start with uh, part one as it provides uh, the basics. And then you can either continue with uh, part two on long-term investing, so wealth accumulation, or part three on short-term trading for income generation. And finally, part four will boost the some selected topics of uh, the first uh, three parts. And uh, last but not least, uh, this is not only a trading and investing course, but also a Python course, but I won't explain the very basics of coding in parts one to four. So I do expect that you know the basics. And if not, I do provide a Python crash course in the appendix at the very end of the course. And uh, there you will learn everything you need to know for the course, no more and no less. So that's uh, the course overview. I hope you enjoy the course and uh, looking forward to seeing you there. Hi and welcome to part one of this course. So part one builds to the basics and prerequisites for the rest of the course. And in my opinion, it's more than that. So it could be a separate standalone Udemy course as it already contains uh, the full set of workflows required for professional and data-driven stock trading and investing. And uh, for those who already have attended some of my other trading and investing courses, there might be of course a few repetitions, but I added several additional and highly valuable uh, topics and workflows. So for example, I introduced the so-called keystone projects in this course as a coding practice for you, but it's more than just a repetition. So there's always something new to be discovered and that uh, will bring your skills and knowledge to a higher level. So in a nutshell, you should not skip part one in any case. And uh, here are some of the learning outcomes of part one. So we start uh, with uh, the very basics of finance and investing. So what's an asset class? the difference between equity and fixed income, and also the difference between trading and investing. Then you will learn how to load uh, data for stocks worldwide. So for example, historical prices, dividends, stock splits, uh, ratios, financial statements, multiples and more. And uh, before we can load data for a particular stock, we need to know the stock ticker. And uh, that's even more important so I will demonstrate how you can get complete lists uh, with uh, stock ticker symbols and of course all for free. So in part one we only work with uh, free data sources. Next we will perform a stock or equity analysis. So a pretty detailed performance analysis with the price returns, dividends, total returns, simple returns, log returns and more. 
and also valuation multiples and uh, we will also analyze uh, the dividend policy of uh, companies and then and uh, this is maybe the heart of part one so i will introduce api trading with interactive brokers so we can trade directly in python with interactive brokers so via the api and uh, then based on uh, the basics you will learn how to create uh, trading algorithms uh, with python and uh, interactive brokers and once again as i really want to encourage you to code on your own i've introduced the several keystone projects not only to repeat uh, what you have learned so far but also to discover and code new things on your own so that's uh, the most important part for any uh, coder or trader and finally, and uh, this should be one of the first uh, things uh, that you should keep in mind. So you have to ask yourself, are your Python skills sufficient for this course and for part one? And uh, if not, then it's better to check out uh, the Python crash course in the appendix. So there you will learn everything you need to know for uh, this course. So for part one and for the other parts. So this is part one of the course, have fun, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next uh, lectures and sections, bye. This course is all about stock trading and equity investing, and uh, equity is one of the major, if not uh, the major asset class in uh, the market. And uh, this leads to the question, uh, what's an asset class, and uh, which asset classes can we observe in the market? An asset class is a grouping of investments that exhibit the similar characteristics and uh, that are subject to the same laws and regulations and uh, they often behave similarly to another in the marketplace. And as an example, equities are also stocks like Apple, Microsoft and uh, Tesla are in the same asset class because uh, they exhibit uh, similar characteristics so actually uh, a stock in apple microsoft and tesla are actually ownership rights in an operating uh, company and uh, those stocks here are listed on the u.s stock exchanges so they are subject uh, to the same laws and regulations and uh, we will see that performance wise uh, they also behave similarly so these uh, three investments belong to the asset class equity and actually in relation to other asset classes so there's uh, usually a very little correlation or even negative correlation between uh, different asset classes and as an example so there's a low or even negative correlation between equities and uh, fixed income and in the next lecture we will go more into the details here so the difference between equities and fixed income but now the question is uh, why do we differentiate investments into uh, different asset classes and uh, you might have already heard that the portfolio diversification is one of the key aspects in investing and uh, sound portfolios uh, with attractive uh, risk return profiles are always uh, or typically diversified portfolios and uh, these portfolios typically include different asset classes with uh, different uh, risk return characteristics and most important asset classes perform differently in any given market so for example fixed income so for example government bonds perform better than equities in an economic downturn and on the other hand side uh, equities perform better than fixed income in an economic upswing and uh, that's uh, the reason uh, why financial advisors typically focus on asset classes to help investors to diversify their portfolios and depending on the market environment they shift asset class weights so for example higher equity weights in economic upswings and uh, more fixed income in economic downturns and uh, by categorizing instruments into asset classes so we can uh, make an investment process easier and more transparent and uh, typically leading to better results better investment results so what are the major asset classes and uh, the two major asset classes and uh, the two most important ones are equities 
and the fixed income, so for example bonds. And in equities, we can differentiate between a listed equity where investors can buy and sell shares in organized markets like stock exchanges. And on the other hand side, we have private equity where shares are privately negotiated and transferred between parties. And uh, for our purposes, of course, we focus on a listed equity only. Then in the fixed income class, we can differentiate by the issuer or the borrower of debt. So we have either the government that borrows money or a company. And uh, whether it's a loan or a bond depend on the lender. So borrowers can borrow money from a bank via loans or they can borrow money from the public via bonds because the bonds are tradable on exchanges. So that's uh, roughly the difference between loans and bonds. So these are the two traditional asset classes. And once again, in this course, uh, we will focus on a listed uh, equity only. And uh, traditionally, all asset classes other than equity and fixed income are alternative investments, like, uh, for example, real estate, commodities like uh, gold or oil. And then we have cryptocurrencies. So that's uh, one of uh, the newer alternative investments. Then we have also currencies, derivatives, and also structured products. And finally, we have money market or cash equivalents like cash, short-term bank deposits, and uh, treasury bills. So treasury bills are very short-term government bonds. And all those money market and cash equivalent instruments have uh, typically a short maturity, a highly liquid market, and uh, low risk. So they don't have to be cash, but uh, they can easily convert it into cash. So these are in a nutshell the available asset classes. And now very often investors ask uh, which is uh, the best asset class. And uh, the best answer is uh, that uh, there's no better or worse. So asset classes are different and uh, they perform differently in different market environments. And having all asset classes in a portfolio is probably the best solution. And now let's have a quick uh, performance uh, comparison. So for the time period from 2013 until 2022. And uh, we have here in blue commodities. So all asset classes are starting here at a base value of 100. Then we have here commodities and uh, they performed uh, quite poor until 2020. But uh, then they obviously outperformed other asset classes here in the post COVID-19 period. Then in purple here we have cash and uh, this is uh, very stable and uh, more or less uh, risk-free. Then in red we have corporate bonds. In green, uh, real estate. And in orange, uh, here we have equities. And uh, we can conclude uh, that the performances in terms of risk and return are different. And uh, what we can say is actually that over longer time periods, uh, equities provide uh, the highest return. And uh, with uh, regard to risk, so cash uh, provides uh, the lowest uh, risk. And actually here in the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we can uh, see that cash and corporate bonds perform better than equities, so in a crisis. And finally, let's analyze uh, the correlations among or between uh, the asset classes. So this is uh, the correlation matrix, and uh, this is based on the same underlying data as uh, the price chart before, but it's a different analysis. And here we can see the correlation factor between uh, the different asset classes. And uh, let's focus here on equities. And actually, if you don't know it, uh, the correlation factor can take values between minus one, so that's perfectly negative correlation, to plus one, a perfect positive correlation, and uh, zero means uh, no correlation. And as an example, so, we have here a negative uh, correlation between equity and government bonds. And uh, this is what I said before. So typically in economic upswing, equity performs better than government bonds. And in a crisis, uh, government bonds perform better than equity. And then in contrast to that, uh, we have a positive correlation 
between equities and uh, real estate. So typically in economic downturns, also real estate prices uh, fall. And finally, we have uh, close to zero correlation between equities and cash because uh, there's uh, literally uh, no risk in uh, cash investments. So once again, uh, typically there's a low correlation between asset classes and uh, from a portfolio perspective, uh, the lower the correlations, uh, the better. And uh, to sum up in this course, uh, we will cover equity investments and uh, equities are in terms of weight and volume, the most popular and the most important asset class. However, for diversified portfolio investing, we should uh, take into account uh, the other asset classes as well. So this is it for the time being. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now the traditional asset classes, equities and fixed income are from a value and also from a volume perspective, the two most important and relevant asset classes. And in this lecture, we will compare equities and fixed income in more detail. And uh, we will also highlight uh, the major differences. And uh, we have learned before that uh, the risk return profiles are different. And uh, here are, uh, is uh, the performance since 2013. So in blue equities and in orange corporate bonds. And over the long run, equities provide higher returns but also higher risks. So there's more volatility here in the equities index. And then in orange, uh, we have here a corporate bond index and uh, there's less uh, volatility and also a relatively better performance here during economic downturns like uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So this is a bit more stable, but also less uh, profitable. And also we have learned uh, that uh, the correlation between equities and fixed income is low. So in this case, it's close to zero, so 0 0.04. And uh, this means whenever the performance of one asset class is poor, then at least uh, there is a good chance uh, that uh, the losses are getting at least partly offset by profits coming from the other asset class. And uh, this is uh, the major idea behind portfolio diversification. Now let's go a bit more into the details and uh, let's have a closer look and uh, comparison between uh, equities and fixed income. So for example, here corporate bonds. And uh, the most important question is, so what is equity and what is uh, fixed income or debt in a nutshell? And what's uh, the legal status of uh, shareholders and uh, bondholders and what's uh, the difference. And actually buying a company stock is uh, buying a company stake. So becoming a owner or a co-owner of uh, the company. And in contrast to that, uh, bondholders only lend money to a company, so in a corporate bond or to a country or a government in a government bond. So they lend money and uh, they only become a lender. And uh, consequently, shareholders are owners and uh, they do have uh, ownership and uh, voting rights. So bondholders do not have ownership and uh, voting rights. Coming now to payment and uh, repayment obligations. So there is no obligation for a company to pay dividends. So dividends are just optional payments depending on the company's profit. So companies can only pay dividends if there are profits and uh, even if there are profits, so there's no obligation to uh, pay dividends. And uh, in contrast to that, uh, typically for a bond or a loan, there is a fixed payment schedule. So with interest payment and uh, redemption repayment, so there are payment obligations here that are fixed in the contract. And uh, typically bondholders uh, receive a fixed uh, interest or coupon payment, for example, 5% per year or 3% per year or whatever. And therefore uh, the upside or profit sharing for bondholders is limited. And on the other hand side, so the upside is unlimited uh, for shareholders. So the better the company performance, uh, the higher the stock price increase. 
and typically also the higher the dividend payments. Coming to the next point, uh, so the ownership in a company is typically indefinite. So there's no term, no fixed term or, or no maturity. And uh, the ownership only ends if uh, the shareholder sells uh, the share or the company is getting liquidated. So for example, in an insolvency case. And uh, in comparison to that, so a bond has typically a fixed term like 10 years and then once uh, the maturity is reached and uh, the bondholder is uh, fully uh, paid back then uh, the contract terminates so there's typically a fixed term or a fixed uh, maturity for the bondholder and uh, coming now to the most important aspect in terms of uh, risk profile so that debt is typically senior to equity debt first so the company first pays interest and redemption and then if uh, there's uh, any profit or any cash left then the company may also pay dividends to uh, the uh, stockholders and therefore we can say that uh, the equity is subordinated to debt and uh, the shareholders only have a residual claim on the company assets after the company paid the interest and uh, the redemption to the bondholders. So subordination is a quite important characteristic for equity and therefore as a direct consequence uh, the risk return profile is different. So it's no surprise uh, that for the equity the risk is high but also the expected return and uh, consequently for the bondholders so the risk is lower but also the expected profit. So this is fixed, uh, the fixed coupon or interest payment. And uh, finally, generally we can say that uh, equities uh, perform relatively better in an economic upswing or boom because the stock prices rise and maybe also companies increase the dividend payments. And uh, we have already learned uh, that uh, bonds are fixed income perform relatively better in an economic downturn or recession. Because as long as a company is able to pay its obligations, so as long as uh, the company is solvent, then no matter if uh, the company makes any profit, or no matter if uh, the stock price rises or falls, then uh, the company uh, still pays actually uh, the fixed interest and uh, the redemption. So bondholders get uh, their fixed payments in any case unless uh, the company is insolvent but uh, there are no additional benefits or upsides and on the other hand side uh, the subordinated shareholders uh, benefit from full upside in an economic upswing. So these are the major differences between equity and uh, fixed income or debt. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. We have learned before that instruments in an asset class exhibit similar characteristics and behave similarly in terms of financial performance. But uh, does a large uh, US tax stock like Apple really behave similarly than an Indian financial industry stock of medium size? And uh, the answer is uh, probably not. And uh, that's why it makes sense to further split uh, the equity class into sub-asset classes and segments. And uh, now let's identify a couple of categories that allow us to further break down uh, the equity class. So here we have uh, the full population of equities and first of all we can differentiate uh, between uh, listed equity and private equity and uh, the focus is clearly on listed equity and then we can uh, further split uh, the whole group of listed equities into a world uh, regions like North America, Europe, Asia and so on. And uh, even more granular we can split by countries like uh, United States, uh, Germany, China and uh, many more. And uh, the next one so developed markets uh, versus emerging markets is related to regions and countries but not identical. And it's all about economic conditions and the major and very stable markets like US, Western, Europe, Australia, Japan are developed markets, while rather newly industrialized countries with high growth 
like China, Brazil, Indonesia and more are emerging markets. And the developed and emerging markets are clearly different in terms of uh, risk return profiles and uh, risk factors. Next, we can differentiate companies and stocks by their business or by their sector and industry. And just to name uh, three of them. So we have financial services, uh, technology and industrials and more. Now, style is another category which is uh, related to sector. So value stocks are typically major stocks uh, that exhibit large profits, but only moderate growth. And uh, growth stocks, as uh, the name says, exhibit high growth, but uh, typically moderate profitability. And uh, typically growth uh, stocks are operating in high tech or innovative sectors and businesses. Finally, size matters and uh, we can dif differentiate between large, mid and uh, small stocks. And uh, the size is typically measured by the market capitalization of stocks. So we will define the market capitalization and how it's calculated uh, later in the course. So this is just an overview and uh, we will cover most of uh, the topics here in more detail in some of uh, the following sections. And uh, for example, it's really important to understand uh, the difference uh, between listed equity and private equity and uh, why we focus on listed equity. So when talking about listed equity, the shares are publicly traded on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange. And in contrast to that, so in private companies, uh, the shares are privately held and transferred. And uh, it's no surprise uh, that uh, listed equity, so the segment is larger, but uh, private equity is smaller but growing. And uh, the most important difference is uh, that uh, listed equity is highly transparent because the listed companies have a lot of reporting obligations. So they have to make uh, their financial statements uh, public and everybody can actually analyze uh, those companies. And in comparison to that, so there are limited financial uh, disclosure obligations for private companies and therefore there's only low or very little transparency. Next and also very important, so prices of listed equity are visible so on an exchange and uh, they are determined in a market. And actually, and that's important for us and our Python course here, so there's tons of market data available for listed equity and uh, that's why we focus on listed equity. So for a data-driven investment approach, we need data, so available data. And uh, for private companies, uh, typically prices are privately negotiated and uh, data availability is rather limited. Finally, listed equity is uh, suitable for retail and also for professional investors, while private equity is typically only for professional investors. Now, company size is uh, one aspect and uh, here we have uh, the performance of uh, large companies, mid-sized companies and uh, small companies at a glance. So these are actually US companies. So we have here three indexes. So a large cap index, a mid cap index and a small cap index. And uh, obviously they are closely together and kind of co-move. And also the correlations are rather high, but still the performance in certain sub periods and market conditions can differ a lot here. And uh, finally, as another example, here's uh, the split by country. So here we have in blue India, in orange uh, US, and then in green Germany and in red Japan. And here we can clearly observe lower correlations and uh, performance differences. So India is an emerging market and it exhibits uh, highest growth and highest returns, but also more volatility and uh, other unique uh, risk factors. So creating sub-asset classes and segments is common practice in uh, the investment industry and it definitely makes sense as uh, we can observe here uh, huge uh, differences in the performance. 
Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. In the last lecture, we have learned that we can split asset classes into subclasses and the segments with categories like country, size and more. And now let's have a little example here and uh, let's start uh, with uh, two stocks. So the Apple stock and uh, the Nike stock and uh, both belong to the asset class equity and uh, more detailed so to listed equity. Then the next question is, are these uh, companies located and operating in developed or emerging markets? And uh, developed markets is uh, the right answer. And uh, more precisely, Apple and Nike are US stocks. And uh, both companies are large companies with a pretty high market capitalization. And finally, let's have a look at uh, the company's uh, businesses. So Apple is operating in the tech sector while Nike is active in the consumer sector. And uh, we can conclude that both companies and stocks are influenced by the very same macro factors. So both are equities in the US, so a developed market. However, they operate in different industries and sectors and uh, they offer different products and different services. So they share many similar characteristics, but also there are different characteristics uh, with uh, regard to the industry and the business sector. And uh, this leads us to the two fundamentally different approaches of uh, investing and investment analysis. So first of all, we have uh, the top-down approach and uh, top-down investing. And uh, this focuses on the big picture or how the overall economy and the macroeconomic factors drive uh, the markets and ultimately the stock prices. And uh, top-down investors uh, will also look at uh, the performance of sectors and industries. So these investors believe that if the sector is doing well, then chances are that uh, the stocks in those industries will also do well. And uh, typically a top-down analysis includes uh, economic growth. So for example, GDP growth and uh, monetary policy, for example, by the Federal Reserve Bank and interest rates, inflation and more, but also international and uh, national politics. So this is top-down analysis and top-down investing. And uh, on the other hand side, a bottom-up investor examines uh, the fundamentals of a stock regardless of market trends uh, when using the bottom-up investing approach. So these investors will focus less on market conditions or macroeconomic indicators. And instead, the bottom-up approach focuses on how an individual company or stock in a sector performs compared to specific companies uh, within the sector. So the bottom-up analysis uh, actually includes uh, the analysis of financial statements and the financial ratios and also valuation multiples then uh, the direct competition uh, products and services and also the management and more so specific to uh, the company or the stock. Now the interesting question is uh, which approach is better and uh, there's actually no clear answer. So while there are advantages to both uh, methodologies, both approaches have the same goal. So identifying uh, great stocks and uh, in any case, so you need uh, the right skills and also the right data. And uh, we will cover both approaches and have some examples uh, for both approaches later in uh, this course here. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. This course is all about stock trading and uh, equity investing. And uh, the term trading includes more than just uh, the technical process of buying and selling shares. So trading and investing are two completely different things. And uh, while listed equity can be used uh, for trading, it's not uh, the first choice for a couple of reasons. And I will explain this in the next minutes. But uh, on the other hand side, uh, listed equity is uh, the major and most important asset class for long-term investors. And uh, in this course, uh, we will cover both 
so trading and investing but once again we should keep in mind uh, that uh, the primary use is long-term investing but now let's compare trading and investing in more detail so trading and investing are two different methods of attempting to profit in the financial markets so investors seek larger returns over an extended period through buying and holding while traders in contrast take advantage of both rising and falling markets and they also enter and exit positions over a shorter time frame so they frequently trade and take smaller more frequent profits and we can also say that trading involves short-term active strategies and uh, the ultimate goal is uh, to generate uh, current income so daily monthly or quarterly cash income and in contrast to that investing takes a long-term and typically passive approach and uh, the ultimate goal is saving and accumulating wealth for the retirement now let me give you some examples for both methods and uh, some buzzwords that you might have heard before so for trading some examples are high frequency trading then also day trading where traders uh, buy and sell the instrument uh, within a day and uh, try to make profits on a daily basis then we have swing trading then algorithmic trading where traders create a trading bot so the trader does not manually trade and uh, the computer does actually the trading and finally we also have a copy trading where a trader can benefit uh, from a strategy of another trader so these are just a few examples and uh, investing is all about uh, portfolio investing or diversified investing and typically high net worth individuals are getting advised by asset managers and uh, one of the more recent uh, trends of services is robo advising where computers and algorithms create portfolios and uh, make uh, the investment decisions and not humans and finally we also have etf trading so that's uh, the most comfortable way for retail investors so they just buy exchange uh, traded funds which are typically highly diversified funds now let's continue with a more detailed comparison and uh, here we have some selected uh, criteria and uh, the investment horizon for trading is short term so typically intraday which is uh, for example minutes or hours or few days or few weeks while the investment horizon for long-term investing is of course long-term and can be between uh, 2 and uh, 50 years or even more. Now the way how profits and income is generated uh, slightly differs. So uh, traders frequently buy and sell and realize trading gains. So they generate frequent cash income that uh, they can reinvest in the next trades while long-term investing is all about long-term growth and long-term wealth accumulation so the value of stocks and funds uh, in an investor's portfolio is steadily increased over longer time periods and uh, the portfolio of long-term investors uh, do not necessarily generate frequent cash so a long-term investor typically receives uh, dividend payments and also some funds uh, distribute profits but generally a long-term investor needs to sell positions uh, to generate uh, significant cash. Now coming to preferred asset classes, so traders and long-term investors typically are interested in different asset classes. So stocks and bonds and also real estate are great asset classes for long-term growth and uh, wealth accumulation. And investors typically buy these assets and hold these for longer time periods so this is uh, clearly a passive typically passive buy and hold strategy and in contrast to that traders prefer asset classes that allow frequent active trading and that means uh, these asset classes must be highly liquid with low trading costs and high price volatility to benefit from price increases and also decreases and uh, forex so foreign exchange markets is uh, the most liquid an active market and most traders prefer forex followed by cryptocurrencies 
and uh, cryptocurrencies are typically highly volatile and uh, there's a good chance to make large profits in a short time period but also the risk uh, to generate high losses. Now traders actively trade uh, these asset classes and uh, take long and also short positions. So with long positions, trader can take advantage of rising prices and a short position allows traders to make profits uh, with falling prices. So traders can make profits in bull and also in bear markets. While long-term investors typically have long positions only, benefiting from long-term growth and uh, price increases in stock and uh, real estate markets. Now, long-term investors typically have physical instruments in their portfolios. So the stock or the bond issued by a company or a government or funds that invest in these uh, physical instruments, while traders, in contrast to that, uh, typically buy and sell derivatives of uh, the underlying assets, so a forex trader typically doesn't trade physical currencies or commodities. He trades uh, derivative instruments uh, designed by a financial institution or a broker. And uh, the value of uh, these derivatives follow or are linked to the underlying asset. And uh, there are actually some good reasons why traders prefer derivatives. So derivative contracts are standardized contracts uh, with high trading volume and uh, low trading costs. And even more important, the derivatives simply allow to take long and also short positions. And uh, they are also allow to trade with leverage. So trading with leverage, also called margin trading, allows to amplify gains, but also losses. And uh, in margin trading, traders use borrowed funds to trade instruments. So they don't pay the full price, but only a small fraction and uh, typically they borrow the rest from the broker. So this is highly risky. And in contrast to that, the long-term investors uh, typically don't work with leverage and uh, trading or transaction costs are typically low because uh, they don't actively trade. However, asset manager fees and ETF fees are often underestimated. So these uh, fees can eat up uh, a high portion of the profit while uh, traders uh, frequently trade and uh, controlling and limiting trading costs in trading is uh, one uh, factor of success so one key factor in trading now trading costs include commissions and uh, even more important and often underestimated uh, bid ask spreads coming now to diversification so long-term investing is all about diversification and uh, portfolio investing so a long-term investor's portfolio is highly diversified while diversification is of less importance in trading. So successful traders nevertheless have several strategies and uh, trade different instruments, but it's more important to create the strategies so that are profitable on a standalone basis. So typical trading strategies are based on technical and also fundamental analysis and more and more important uh, AI-based strategies, so with machine learning and deep learning. And finally, we also have a statistical arbitrage. And uh, there's a broad range of strategies for long-term investing, so from pure passive ETF investing to more specialized portfolio optimization strategies, and finally to style investing like large cap versus small cap, and uh, value versus growth and the uh, factor investing and more. Finally, coming maybe to the most important aspects, uh, return and risk. And a div diversified portfolio typically generates uh, 5 to 10% per year over longer time periods uh, with uh, low to moderate risk. And in contrast to that, uh, the target return for traders is uh, typically 10% per month. So that's uh, at least uh, the target or the desired return. And uh, I don't want to say that it's simple or realistic in particular for beginners to generate 10% per month and more, but traders who generate 10% per month and more definitely know what uh, they are doing and uh, they have the right skills to create good strategies and uh, they also trade with high leverage. So they take high risks as well. So that's just uh, the reality. No profits uh, without taking risks. And sometimes a picture tells more than many words and numbers. And uh, this is a typical chart here 
for trading. It's a candlestick chart. And the candlestick chart that describes price movements of a security. And each bar or each candlestick stands here or shows uh, the price movement or the performance in a certain time interval. And uh, the time intervals can be one minute, one hour, one day, one month or whatever. But typically in intraday trading, it's uh, one minute or five minutes. And a green bar or a green candle indicates a price increase. So for example, from here to here in that time period. And a red bar indicates a price decrease from here to here. So traders typically work with uh, candlestick charts and uh, try to identify price uh, patterns with uh, moving average lines and uh, more complex uh, tools. So that's here, trading at a glance. And uh, this is a typical chart for investing. So in long-term investing, it's all about finding the right portfolio that either maximizes uh, the return given a certain amount of risk or minimizing the risk given a target return. And uh, diversification is uh, the key to actually reach uh, that target. So these are the major differences between trading and investing. But uh, no matter if you trade or invest, decisions should be based on quantitative and uh, data-driven analysis. So you need data like fundamental data or price and volume data. And uh, traders and investors need to measure the performance and analyze risk and uh, use optimization tools to improve and optimize uh, the performance and to manage risk. And uh, in particular in trading, backtesting and forward testing and also other simulation tools uh, can definitely help to improve uh, trading de decisions and uh, trading performance. And all these uh, things require an appropriate uh, knowledge and skill set to create a systematic and the profitable strategies uh, that are definable and unambiguous. So trades and investments should follow a systematic strategy or a systematic idea. And uh, this means that traders should be able to write down a rule, an algorithm or a formula. And as a side note, uh, also self-learning algorithms like uh, machine learning or deep learning algorithms are clearly definable. So they can be a black box inside, but nevertheless, uh, they can be documented and uh, defined as well. And uh, once you have defined a strategy, you should be able to test how the strategy would have performed in the past. So you should be able to measure and quantify the performance of a strategy for any period and uh, for any instrument. And typically a strategy that meets uh, the first two points here is also reproducible. So with the right documentation, any trader can reproduce uh, the strategy for any time period and uh, for any instrument. Now it's important to mention here that the trading and investment decisions uh, that are primarily based on gut feeling and or intuition do not meet uh, the above criteria. And uh, I don't want to say here that you can't make profits uh, with that approach, but uh, you will definitely increase your chances if uh, you have a clear plan and uh, the skills and resources to execute that plan. And at least you should have somebody who has uh, the plan and the skills. So for example, if you passively invest in ETFs, then you can benefit uh, from uh, the skills and uh, the resources of uh, those managers. But of course, it's best to build uh, your own skills here. And uh, that's exactly the plan for the next lectures and sections of this course. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. We are now able to make trades on uh, the trading platforms. However, the plan is to trade with uh, Python and to create Python algorithms to uh, run our strategies. And uh, therefore, in the very first step, we have to install Python. So in this section, I will show you how to install Python and all required packages and libraries and how to work with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And actually, I highly recommend to work with uh, the full Anaconda installation. So Anaconda is a package manager 
that helps us uh, to install all required packages and libraries in the right versions. Now, in case you already have a full Anaconda installation, you can skip the next lecture. However, please make sure that you have an updated installation. So you can update your Anaconda installation with uh, the command conda update anaconda. And in case you are working on a Windows machine, you have to enter this command in the anaconda prompt. And on Mac, it's a terminal window. Now, in case you have a Python installation other than uh, the Anaconda installation, I highly recommend that you fully remove uh, the other installation. So two parallel installations uh, can cause many problems, in particular on Macs. So please uh, remove uh, the other installation. And of course, uh, for those who haven't installed Python yet, uh, the next uh, three lectures uh, will guide you through the installation steps. So thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. Hi and welcome back. This is one of the most important lectures in this course. And in the next minutes, I will show you how to download and install Python. And uh, there are many ways how to install Python. And the best and most efficient way is to download and install the full Anaconda installation. So Python is uh, way more than just uh, the Python standard library. And actually the real power of Python and uh, the reason why Python is so popular is that uh, there are dozens or hundreds of add-on libraries and packages for data science, machine learning, and other purposes. And uh, many of uh, these additional libraries, so I guess it's over 100, are already included in the full Anaconda installation. Anaconda is, so to say, the all-around carefree package for everyone seeking to minimize installation steps and the complexity and ongoing maintenance of the system. However, this comes at a cost and uh, actually the download is uh, pretty large and requires some free memory on your computer. Essentially, Anaconda is a package manager that guarantees uh, that you have the most important uh, libraries and packages installed and it automatically selects uh, the most uh, compatible versions. And as long as we keep our entire Anaconda installation updated, we don't have to care about different versions of uh, libraries and packages. All right, now let's go to the Anaconda website and uh, we can simply open Google and uh, search for Anaconda. And here it is, so let's uh, click here. And uh, let's go to products. So there are different versions and uh, good news is uh, that uh, the individual edition is uh, completely free and open source. And uh, let's click here. So there are over 20 million users worldwide that use Anaconda here. And with uh, the full Anaconda installation, you are best equipped uh, to perform your data science and machine learning tasks. So let's have a look here. And for instance, Jupyter is included. So Jupyter notebooks are actually our coding environment where we will spend uh, most of the time. Then uh, we have uh, the pandas library for tabular data. Then we have scipy and numpy for scientific and numerical computing. Then next we have some libraries uh, for machine learning like Keras, uh, TensorFlow or scikit-learn. And also for data visualization, we have matplotlib, uh, seaborn, and uh, also plotly here. And we have some libraries for dashboarding and image processing. So now let's go back here. And uh, for some more information, you can go to the documentation. So uh, I open here a new window with uh, the documentation. And uh, here we are in the Anaconda individual edition and uh, there's uh, a installation guide. So we will go through the major steps, but of course you can also go more into the details here. So feel free to have a closer look here. And here, for instance, we can select uh, installation on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. And also there's a guide how to update or how to uninstall Anaconda. And also there's a user guide. So getting started with Anaconda for instance. 
And uh, now let's close uh, the window here and uh, let's go to the installation. So the installation here is at the very end. And depending on which operating system you use, uh, there are different Anaconda installers, so for Windows, for Mac and uh, for Linux. And uh, for Mac, I would highly recommend um, the 64-bit uh, graphical installer and also for Linux. And uh, for Windows, we have uh, the choice between a 64-bit and 32-bit graphical installer. And if you're not sure whether to select uh, the 64-bit or the 32-bit version, you can go to your control panel and have a look at your system. And here the system type uh, for my computer is 64-bit, so I can select uh, the 64-bit variant. So typically the newer systems are all 64-bit. And uh, finally, you can also see that uh, we have uh, the choice between Python uh, 3.7 and Python uh, 2.7. And obviously, of course, uh, 3.7 is uh, the newer version. And of course, I highly recommend uh, to download 3.7. So there's actually no reason to install Python 2.7 unless uh, you are working with uh, some legacy code. But of course, in our case here, we create a new code that is uh, based on Python 3. So essentially the installation works pretty much in the same way irrespective if you have a Windows or Mac or Linux. And as I'm working here on a Windows machine, I will now download uh, the Windows version here. But before we download and install Anaconda, please uh, note the following. In case you already have another Python installation on your computer, so other than Anaconda, Please remove that other installation because uh, this can cause some negative interferences later on. And uh, this holds true in particular if you are working on a Mac. So now let's start the download and I click here on Windows Python 3.7 64-bit. And actually I'm saving the Anaconda installer on uh, the desktop. So let's click on save. And this can take a while because it's 466 megabyte. All right, we have finished the download. And uh, let's go to the desktop. And here we can find uh, the Anaconda 3 installer and let's double click. So this is uh, the setup here and let's click on next. And of course, uh, we agree here on the license. And it's recommended to just install for us, so just uh, me. And it's also highly recommended uh, to select uh, the proposed destination folder. So on Windows, it's typically the users folder. And on Mac, uh, the users or home folder. So actually, I wouldn't uh, recommend uh, to uh, change that here. And also here we should select uh, the default setting. So register Anaconda 3 as my default uh, Python 3 installation. And uh, finally, let's click on install. And uh, this uh, can take some time. All right, the setup was completed successfully and let's click on next. And uh, this is uh, the information that PyCharm, which is a development environment is available. And here are some more helpful tips, but let's uh, disable it and uh, let's uh, finish. And with uh, this, we have successfully downloaded and installed Anaconda. And in the next lecture, we will make our very first steps uh, with Anaconda and uh, Jupiter. So hope to see you there. Bye. Hi and welcome back to our course. So now as we have installed uh, the Anaconda distribution, we can open our very first Jupyter notebook where we can write and run our Python code. And uh, there are actually two ways to open a Jupyter notebook. So first of all, via the Anaconda navigator. So let's search for the Anaconda navigator. And you can see it here as an app. Yeah, and opening a Jupyter notebook via the Anaconda Navigator is yeah, actually a bit more convenient and more user-friendly than um, the second option, which we will see later.
right, thanks for installing. Okay, don't show again. And here we see different apps and uh, what we are interested in is in the Jupyter Notebook app. And as we can read here, the Jupyter Notebook is a web-based interactive computing notebook environment where we can edit and run human readable docs while describing the data analysis. Yeah, so in easy words, we can actually use Jupyter Notebook to write and run our code, but also we can use it as a text editor and uh, just write text and integrate images and visualizations and also HTML code and much more. And in particular in data science, uh, Jupyter Notebook is uh, very popular because yeah, you can do your data analysis and write your code and also use it as a text editor and describe and say what you are doing actually. And also in research, uh, Jupyter Notebook is quite popular. So there are some researchers which yeah, actually submit their research papers as a Jupyter Notebook. All right, so let's launch our first Jupyter Notebook. And what Anaconda does actually, it opens a local server in our standard internet browser. So here we are in our internet browser actually. However, we are not uh, connected to the internet, so we can also use um, a Jupyter Notebook offline. However, there's the option to use it uh, on a web server, but um, yeah, this is not a topic of our course actually. So now here we are on the Jupyter dashboard and uh, this serves like a homepage for our Jupyter Notebooks and uh, the main purpose is to display our notebooks and files in our current directory. And depending on uh, which folder you installed Anaconda before, we can see here the folder structure of um, yeah, the folder where you installed Anaconda. And in my case, it was um, here uh, the user folder. And actually you can see here, so this is actually the same folder structure. So Jupyter Notebook actually makes yeah, a reference to our users folder here. All right, so let's open our first Jupyter Notebook and therefore we are going here to new and we are opening a Python 3 Notebook. So here we are in the Notebook and first of all we can change uh, the name of our Notebook if we go here to Untitled and say, okay, let's call this Notebook Test and here we can rename it. So now our notebook's um, name is test. We can also change the name by going here to file and uh, rename. So this is the same. Uh, we can also name it, let's say test one. And now we can go into our first cell. So this is a coding cell actually, where we can yeah, write our code or also yeah, just text. And you can see here which uh, yeah, mode we have and uh, this is now set to code. So we can now code a, a Python code here. So let's say we try to use Python as a calculator. So one plus one. And now we want to run or execute our code. And there are actually four options to run our code. So option number one is uh, yeah, by just clicking here run. And there you can see the output or the result of our code is two. So we can see here our cell. This is actually the input to yeah, our Python kernel. And here you can see the output of our code too. And now we can go to the next cell and for example, calculate the three plus three. And um, the second option to run the cell is by just clicking here. And no surprise in the output is six. And we can run a cell multiple times. So let's run again our first cell and let's use um, the third alternative. We can press shift enter here. So again, we get two and with shift enter, we run the cell and then we are selecting automatically the next cell. So now we are here in our cell two. And let's go back to our first cell here. There is um, another option to run the cell. And with um, the keyboard shortcut Alt Enter, we can run the cell and then insert a new cell below. So let's um, run the cell with Alt Enter. And there you can see we have run the cell. Our output is again two. And now we inserted a new cell here. 
And here we can calculate, let's say, 2 plus 2. And um, the actually fifth and the last option to run the cell is by control enter. So let's tap control enter. And there you can see we get the output 4, but we are yeah stay in our current cell here. So we are not creating a new cell. So we have five options to run the cell and depending on what we want to do as a next step, yeah, we can either go to the next cell with the shift enter or we can create uh, another cell with alt enter. So there's a lot of flexibility. All right, so once we are finished with our code, we can also save our Jupyter notebook by clicking here on the save button. And we can also save our Jupyter notebook here, save and checkpoint. And then we can close our Jupyter Notebook. And here you can see this is now our Jupyter Notebook file. And uh, this is here on our dashboard. And also if we open here our user file, we can also find here the Jupyter Notebook file here in our users folder. And the green icon says um, that the, the Jupyter Notebook is still running even if we have closed it. So to really close it, we have to go here on running. And here we can see that still one notebook is running, so we have to shut down it. So it's not enough to just close the, the Jupyter Notebook, so we have to shut down it here under running. And now you can see it's black. Alright, let's close here the Jupyter Notebook, the dashboard. Okay, quit, yes. And before I said that there are two alternatives to open a Jupyter Notebook. So the first uh, alternative is via the Anaconda Navigator and the second is via Anaconda Prompt. So let's search for it. And here you can see the Anaconda Prompt. And this is in kind of a command style. So the command is actually the primary interface for managing installations of various packages. So you can actually query and search Anaconda packages like uh, NumPy or Pandas. And we can check the current uh, Anaconda installation. And we can also create uh, new environments and install and update add-on packages to our existing uh, environment. However, before I said that the Anaconda Navigator with um, the graphical user interface is a bit more yeah, user-friendly and convenient because you don't have to enter manual commands. So what do I mean with manual commands? So if you want to open a Jupyter Notebook here with the Anaconda prompt, we have to tap in Jupyter Notebook. And then if we press enter, Actually, also our Jupyter Notebook dashboard opens here. So here we can see our test uh, Jupyter Notebook. We can reopen it. And here we can see our Jupyter Notebook test one. So there are two ways to open our Jupyter dashboard. So either via the Anaconda Navigator or by the Anaconda prompt. And um, yeah, it's actually a matter of taste what you prefer here. And yeah, you can do whatever you like. All right, so now we are finished with uh, this session and in the next session we will have a deeper look into the Jupyter Notebook. See you there, bye! Hello and welcome back to our course. So in this session we are going a bit deeper into the most important modes and functionalities of Jupyter Notebooks. Also we will have a look at the most frequently used uh, keyboard shortcuts that uh, makes actually our life easier and more efficient. However, as uh, with all new things, um, the best and fastest way to get uh, familiar and comfortable with Jupyter Notebooks is, of course, by practice and coding on your own. You will see after a few hours of working with Jupyter that it's getting more and more intuitive. Alright, so nevertheless, I want to give you some good hints and uh, help for the start. So let's open a Jupyter Notebook with uh, the Navigator. And we want to create a brand new Jupyter Notebook. And we could call it test2. And let's start with an easy code. So let's calculate 1 plus 1. And we run the cell by pressing Shift Enter. So now we are on the next line. 
And here we could calculate a four plus four and also execute the cell by pressing shift enter. And in the last session, I said that um, when we are here in, in this cell, we can see here that um, the setting is uh, code. So if we start writing, we are actually writing Python code and we can change uh, this to markdown. So now the setting is markdown and um, this is uh, simply a text editor. So if we now start uh, writing here and run the cell, we are getting yeah a text actually. And now we are in the new cell and you can see by default um, the setting is to code, but uh, we can of course change it again to markdown. And what we can also do, we can make hierarchical headings. So by starting a line with um, the hash key and a space, and then by writing a text, we can create a header with um, yeah, a larger font size. So let's run here. And let's maybe let's name here our header calculator. And then now in the next cell, we want to create a subheader and let's call the subheading, let's say edition. Uh, first of all, we have to make the setting to markdown. And then we press hash key and make a space. So now we have the same hierarchy. So um, the font size is identical. And if we add here another hash key, the font size is getting smaller. So addition could be a lower hierarchical heading. And by adding more and more hash keys, it's getting smaller. So let's take two hash keys and run the cell. And now we can also move our heading um, to the top of our Jupyter notebook by pressing here, move selected cells up. So we can move it here up. Also the addition. Jupyter Notebook has two modes. Um, so there's the edit mode and the command mode. And uh, the edit mode is indicated by a green cell border. So if we go into the cell here, we click into the cell, then we see here a green cell border. And when a cell is in the edit mode, uh, yeah, we can type into the cell and uh, type our Python code or our text. So here we can change from one plus one to one plus 12, let's say, and then we can run the cell and we get 13. So we changed um, the content of the cell in the edit mode. And the second mode, the command mode is indicated by a gray cell border and uh, the blue margin here. And when we are in a command mode, we are able to edit the notebook as a whole, but we cannot type into the individual cell. So for example, in command mode, we can yeah, add and delete cells and yeah, make more changes to the whole notebook. And there are two ways from switching from the command mode to the edit mode. So either we go with our mouse cursor into the cell, so we can see it changes from blue to green. And then we can go back to command mode by clicking here outside the cell. So you can see here we are blue again in the command mode. And there are also keyboard shortcuts for it. So we are now in the command mode and if we click enter, we are getting to the edit mode. And when we are in the edit mode and press in the escape key, then we are coming back to the command mode. So what can we do in the command mode? For example, we can add a cell above our cell. So we can now press um, the key A for inserting a cell above. And now here we have inserted a cell above. And let's go back to our cell here. So now we are in edit mode. We press escape to go to the command mode. And then we press um, the B key to insert a cell below. There you can see we have now inserted a cell below. And let's go down to our nonsense cell here. And yeah, we can delete a cell by pressing DD, so double D. Now we have deleted the cell. And there are also keyboard shortcuts to change um, the setting. So now here by default, uh, we have um, the code setting. And now we can change um, the setting to markdown by pressing in the command mode key M. There you can see here now it changed to markdown. And we can change it back to code by pressing the Y key. So you can see here now we are back to code. And there are many more shortcuts and we can have a look and also modify the shortcuts by going here to help and edit keyboard shortcuts. And there you can see many shortcuts. So run cell and select uh, the next cell, shift enter. 
run the cell and yeah, staying in the cell is uh, control enter and uh, run cell and insert a cell below is alt enter. So we already learned that. Then here enter to the edit mode by pressing enter. So again, all these shortcuts only work if we are in the command mode, not in the edit mode. And what we also have here, we have insert cell above um, A and insert cell below B and change cell to code uh, is in the Y key and change cell to markdown is uh, the M key. And yeah, there are many more shortcuts. And it's a little bit a matter of taste if and which shortcuts you, you want to use actually. So it's completely up to you. So sometimes it's helpful and uh, yeah, in my opinion, sometimes not. All right. And what I also want to show you, we can actually store a value, let's say five into a variable, let's say a, so a equals five. Yeah, we can actually execute a cell with a, so this is called printing. And now we get five because Python knows um, a is five. And what we can do now, we can change here our calculations above and say, okay, I want to calculate a, a one plus a. So and this gives us six. And also, for example, here, I want to calculate four plus a gives nine. Yeah, and maybe I want to change here to two plus a gives us seven. Yeah, this is actually the good thing about Jupyter Notebooks and what makes the Jupyter Notebook so comfortable and easy to use that actually each cell is running independently from other cells. And yeah, we can switch here from cell to cell, run this cell, that cell and then go back to, to our previous cell. And we can see here on the left, um, yeah, the sequence, how we have um, run our cells. So our actually oldest cell is here line four, then we executed line five, then line seven, and then uh, line eight. And for example, let's make here something which Python cannot verify or Python do not know what to, to do with it. So let's say two plus times three so this is not defined in python and uh, whenever we do something which is not not defined in python then python uh, drops us an error message yeah and here we can see the comfortable thing about jupyter notebooks that um, we get an error message for only the cell which has code uh, that is not defined so this does however not impact the other cells so all the other cells um, yeah still work and uh, still show an output here and this is in particular for beginners very convenient as it encourages you to code by trial and error and you do not have to take care about uh, making errors actually because you only get an error message for the particular cell and you can quickly edit your cell and, and change your error. So now here we know that uh, two plus times uh, three does not work. So we can modify here and now we have changed it. And now let's assume we want to change a, so a is not five, but uh, let's say seven. Then we see here, so the latest cell that was executed is uh, line 11. And here we can see in line eight, so the output has not changed, even if we changed um, line 11, where we defined a equals seven. So in line eight, where we calculate two plus a, this is uh, still seven because before a was five and line 11, so the reassignment of a was uh, later than our line eight here. And now if we want to update here our output to our new a, we have to run the cell again. So now it's nine and we can see that uh, this cell was executed after the new assignment of A. So now line 12 should already contain um, the new A. So this is uh, the very good thing about Jupyter Notebook. So you can switch here from line to line and you can make errors and you can modify your errors. So no problem at all. However, in the end, yeah, it definitely makes sense to actually rearrange your code in, in a sequence and that uh, makes sense actually. So now we should put here the assignment of A to the very top of our code. So A equals seven. And let's say we rerun it again. And also here, the printing of A, we can move up. Then we rerun it. Now we can also rerun all the other cells. So now two plus a is nine. We can delete the cell here. Four plus a should then be 11. And two plus three is still five. So now you can see here we have a sequence from top to bottom.
at the end it always makes sense to, to rearrange the sequence in, in that manner actually. And what we can also do here by clicking to kernel, then we can either restart, um, yeah, to say Python or the Python kernel and clear all output. So if we do that, you can see here, so there's no output. So we have still the code in our lines, but the code is not executed. And now we can execute or run the cells here in a sequence with shift enter. So now we have again the sequence from one till five. And what we can also do, we can do this in one step. So we can clear our output and run the cells again, beginning from line one by pressing restart and run all. So restarting the kernel and running it again makes definitely sense um, from time to time. So if you have a very complex project with many lines in your Jupyter notebook, so at uh, some point in time, it makes sense to yeah, rearrange the sequence and then restart your code again. So sometimes, um, yeah, there's a mistake or something which, which doesn't work and uh, you actually do not know why it's not working. And um, then it definitely makes sense to, to restart here. All right, so let's save here our notebook and let's close um, the notebook here. And we also shut our notebook down. And now there's one last thing I want to show you. So let's go back to our test two notebook. So before we shut down here the notebook and now we opened it again and we can still see here um, the output. However, our notebook behaves like um, the cells have never been run. So our variable A is yeah, actually not stored in Python and there we can try it by typing uh, three plus A. So we would expect 10 and we get an error message, um, name A is not defined. So whenever we open a closed notebook, so all of the variables and other things, um, they are not stored. So whenever we open a notebook again, we have to go to kernel and restart and run all cells here. Now we can see we have a sequence from one to six and here three plus A works. And alternatively, if we open um, the notebook, we can run all cells here with uh, just um, going to cell here and say run all. So here we do not have a sequence from one till, till six, but still we have run all cells um, from the top to the bottom. So now we are finished with our installation in Jupyter Notebook Basics and I hope you enjoyed it and yeah, see you in the next session, bye. All right, we have successfully installed Python and Anaconda and in the next section, section is, uh, five, we will start uh, with equity and uh, data analysis with Python. But uh, before you move on, you should have at least uh, some basic Python and Pandas coding skills. So in my opinion, in case you are a complete Python beginner, it uh, may be not uh, the best idea to continue here with uh, section five. But uh, the good news is that the course includes a detailed Python crash course in the appendix at uh, the end of the course. And uh, this crash course is customized for this course here. And uh, there you will learn Python coding skills required for this course, no more and no less. And now let's have a quick look here into uh, the appendix. So we start here with uh, Python and also some finance basics. So uh, these are really the basics of Python coding. And then we have some user-defined functions, also an important topic. Then we will cover the data science the libraries, NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. So uh, typically in this course, we will heavily work with the Pandas data frames. And then we also have some advanced uh, Pandas time series methods. And uh, finally, in Appendix 5, uh, you will find an introduction to object-oriented programming. So once again, if you are a complete Python beginner, then uh, you should definitely start uh, the course here in the appendix. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. Successful stock trading and investing is always based on financial data and a detailed uh, financial data analysis. But before we can analyze data, we need uh, the right data sources. And uh, typically financial data is not for free. So professional high-end solutions like uh, the Bloomberg Terminal is uh, really expensive. However, the good news is uh, that uh, there do exist free sources. And probably one of uh, the best sources is Yahoo Finance. 
So I'm here on the Yahoo Finance website, so finance.yahoo.com. And here we not only can find tons of data for stocks, bonds, indexes, funds, uh, cryptos, commodities, and so on, but uh, even more important, we can load uh, the data with and into Python via the Yahoo Finance API. So API stands for Application Programming Interface, and uh, that allows us to use Python code to communicate uh, with uh, the Yahoo Finance databases to extract data from the database. And uh, that's uh, the ultimate goal here for this section. And uh, we will see this in more detail in the next lectures. But for now, let's just browse here through the website and uh, let's get some more detailed information for one stock. So for example, for the Apple stock, and uh, we can search here for stocks, funds, indexes, uh, cryptos, commodities, and more. So let's just type here Apple and here we can find uh, the Apple stock and uh, the ticker symbol is AAPL. So each and every stock has a unique uh, ticker symbol. So AAPL for Apple. So let's click on it. And then we are here on the Apple page. So here we can see that uh, Apple is traded on NASDAQ. And uh, here we get uh, real-time prices in US dollar. And here we have the latest stock price on uh, Friday, the 21st of October at uh, 4 p.m. So that's uh, the time when uh, the stock market closes in New York. So in uh, Eastern time here. So generally the New York Stock Exchange opens at 9.30 a.m. and it closes at 4 p.m. And also we can see here the change uh, relative uh, to the previous uh, trading day. So Thursday uh, the 20th, so it's plus 3.88 and uh, relatively it's 2.71%. So this is here the price in US dollar for one Apple stock, 147.27. And then we can get many more information. So we are here at the, the summary and for example, we can see the previous close and many more information. And uh, we will cover most of uh, these uh, points here in one of uh, the later sections or lectures. And then here on the right, uh, we can see the price chart. So for the last day or for the last five days, for the last uh, one month or the maximum. So since 1980. And uh, we can clearly see that uh, prices uh, increased, steadily increased here. So of course uh, there's a growth in uh, the Apple stock. And finally, let's click here through uh, the categories. So we can go to the more detailed chart. So here we can see the price and below the trading volume. So we will go more into the details here in the next lectures. Then we have some more statistics, so valuation measures, stock price, history, financial highlights and more. And then historical data, so open, high, low, close data and trading volume. Then we have some more information on uh, the company itself and some financials like income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement and a more detailed analysis. And once again, it's great uh, to have uh, the data here on the website, but it's uh, even better to actually load uh, the data via the API into Python. And uh, once again, that's uh, the plan for the next lectures. And we can also get some more information on uh, the options and the stockholders. So this is it for the time being. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures. Bye. Now, in case you haven't done it yet, in this lecture I will demonstrate how you can download, open and work with all Jupyter Notebooks of part one of the course. And uh, most important, you can find uh, the download attached uh, to lecture eight in section two. So download course materials part one. And here you can find the resources and you can click on it 
and uh, then you find uh, the zip file part one materials and then you can click on it and uh, then you can download it to your local computer and uh, for example you could, could uh, select uh, the desktop and now let's click on save and now i'm going to check uh, my desktop and uh, here I can find uh, the folder part one materials and uh, this is a zip folder and uh, first of all you should unzip the folder with a right click and uh, then extract all. So click on extract here and then you can find uh, the unzipped file here on your desktop and uh, we can simply open it and uh, check uh, what we can find here. So essentially here we have four Jupyter Notebooks. So Notebook 1 to Notebook 4. So from Equity Introduction to Financial Data Analysis. So that's uh, the plan for part one of this course. And now let's go right into Notebook 1. So Equity Introduction Part 1. And uh, first of all, I will go to my Anaconda Navigator. So this is uh, the Anaconda Navigator and uh, then we open or launch uh, the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, here we can find and open all notebooks uh, that are located on our local computer. And uh, by default, uh, this is actually a view on uh, the users folder. So on Windows, it's uh, the users folder and uh, on Mac, it's uh, the home folder. And in my case, uh, the part one materials folder is on my desktop and therefore I click here on the desktop and uh, now I can find uh, the files on my, on my desktop and let's go to part one materials. And uh, here we can find uh, the four notebooks and uh, now in this section, uh, we will work with Notebook 1 Equity Introduction Part 1. And uh, by clicking on it, we can actually open the Jupyter Notebook. Here we are. And uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this section, we will work with uh, the Y Finance API that allows us uh, to actually pull tons of financial data from Yahoo Finance. And uh, we actually need a separate uh, package or library, so the Y Finance library. And uh, Y Finance is not uh, installed in the Anaconda distribution by default. And uh, we need to install it separately. And uh, this is here the very first step, so installing Y Finance. And uh, if uh, you are working on a Windows machine, you have to open Anaconda prompt. And if you are working on a Mac, you have to open a terminal window and then you have to uh, copy paste here the following command. So pip install Y Finance. And uh, now as I'm working on a Windows machine, uh, let me open the Anaconda prompt so I can search for it. And uh, here is uh, the Anaconda prompt. And then I can simply copy and paste here the command pip install Y finance. So let's press the enter key here. And now I have successfully installed uh, Y finance version 0 0.185 and uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now let's take the very first steps uh, with uh, the Y Finance API. And uh, to work with Y Finance here, we need to import uh, the uh, Y Finance package. And uh, for example, we can import Y Finance as uh, YF. And then we also need Pandas as PD and Matplotlib uh, as uh, PLT. And uh, for charts, we use uh, the Seaborn style. And then we want to analyze one of uh, the most well-known and most popular stocks, uh, the Apple stock. 
and uh, the correct uh, ticker symbol for Apple is uh, AAPL. So let's save uh, the ticker symbol here in the variable symbol. And uh, first of all, let's go back to the Y Finance website. And uh, for example, here to uh, the Apple stock. And uh, once again, uh, we have here the summary and the current price. And uh, typically one of the most important uh, data or information for stock traders and investors is historical trading data. So historical prices and uh, historical trading volume. And uh, we can click here on historical data. And uh, for example, here we have uh, the most uh, recent trading day. So October 21st in the year 2022. And here we have open high, low and uh, close prices and also adjusted close prices. And uh, we will go more into the details of uh, these prices here in this and the next lectures. And finally, we also have uh, the trading volume. So this is uh, the most recent complete uh, trading day. So typically it's uh, yesterday or in my case here, it's uh, Friday. So currently it's uh, Sunday, the 23rd. So we have here the last trading day and then we have uh, some more days. So depending on our settings here. And actually we can manually download here uh, the historical price and volume data by clicking here on download and then we can download an Excel sheet. But of course it uh, would be much uh, more convenient if we could uh, actually get uh, the data here via the Y Finance API and load uh, the data directly into a Python and Pandas. And uh, that's uh, the plan here for this and the next lectures. And uh, we can simply download historical data with uh, the Y Finance library and uh, the method download. And here the first and the most important parameter is uh, tickers. So you can get here more information on the parameters if you go here inside uh, the parentheses of uh, the method and then press and hold uh, shift and to press uh, the tab key two times. So shift, tab, tab, and then you get here the little description. And uh, so here we can see the most important parameters. So it's the uh, tickers. And uh, for example, we can pass here our single symbol Apple. And if we do this, then we actually download the historical data here. So the tabular data set into Python and Pandas. And uh, then we can save here the resulting data frame in, uh, for example, the variable DF. So let's do this here. And here we can see we have successfully completed uh, the download. And here we have one data frame. And uh, this data frame contains uh, more than 10,000 rows. So more than 10,000 days. And uh, we have here six columns. And in the index, uh, we have uh, the date and uh, the time. And actually the price data for Apple starts here on the 12th of December, 1980. And uh, once again, this is here the most recent uh, and complete trading day. So it's uh, the 21st of October here in my case. And in addition to the date, we also have the time. So it's uh, midnight here. And then we have some more information. So minus uh, five hours or here minus uh, four hours. And uh, we can get more information on the index if we just access here the index. So DF index. And here we can see it's a daytime index. And uh, uh, this is actually localized to America or New York time. So New York Eastern time. And it's important to know and understand here that here on Pandas, so the time is uh, relative to UTC time. So UTC stands for Coordinated Universal Time and uh, New York time is here five hours or four hours uh, behind uh, UTC time. So depending on whether we have summer time or winter time so to sum up, uh, we do have here New York time, midnight, and uh, this is uh, five hours or four hours behind uh, UTC time.
And then we can also get uh, some more meter information on our data frame with uh, the uh, pretty uh, helpful method info. And uh, once again, here we can see that uh, we have a daytime index in the index. So from 1980 until 2022, so October, then we have six columns. So open, high, low, close, adjusted, close and volume. And uh, here we have numerical data, so either float or an integer here for the trading volume. And uh, apparently we have here no missing values. So all 10,555 elements in all columns are non-null. That means uh, non-missing, so we do have data here. And then finally we have here a summary of the data types. So five times the float and uh, in one column integers and uh, the memory usage. So 577.2 kilobyte. And now let me provide uh, some more information on uh, the index and uh, the columns here. So first of all, we have here the index, uh, the date, and uh, this is in the format year, month, day. So year, month, day, and then we have here the time and uh, then the time relative to UTC time. And actually the time zone here is New York time, so at midnight. And it's important to know that uh, we only have business daily data, so we don't have weekends and uh, we don't have uh, bank holidays. So for example here, the 12th of uh, December 1980 was a Friday and then we have no data on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, then again, we have data on the 15th, uh, which is a Monday. Then we have the first price column, the open column. And here we have uh, daily open prices. So at uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time zone. So that's uh, when uh, New York Stock Exchange is actually open uh, business. And uh, likewise, we have the close price. So when the trading closes at 4 p.m. So in simple words, uh, we have the first price and uh, the last price. And uh, in between, we have uh, the highest uh, or the maximum daily price, which is uh, the high price and uh, the lowest price, so low. And finally, we also have uh, the adjusted close price. And uh, this is uh, the close price adjusted for dividend payments, backward adjusted. And uh, we will have a closer look on the adjusted close price in one of the next lectures. And uh, finally, we have here the daily uh, trading volume. So that's uh, the number of uh, traded shares on a particular day. So for example, here we have uh, actually 86 million shares traded on uh, the last uh, trading day here. So this is uh, the historical uh, data table and uh, this is uh, the very same that we can also see here on the website. So we have here the same columns. And finally, we can simply create a price chart. So for example, for the close prices, so we can select uh, the close column and then use uh, the plot method. And for example, uh, we can determine a fixed size or so a figure size 12.8 and a font size and uh, we can create uh, labels for the y-axis so price in US dollar and a title so the Apple price chart and then we are here we have uh, the Apple price chart from the very beginning until today and uh, we could also see this here if we go to max then this is uh, the Apple price chart and then we can also get uh, the volume chart as a bar chart. And it makes sense uh, to actually select, uh, for example, only one month. So for example, June 2022 and uh, the volume. So we can do this here with uh, the log operator and then we can create a bar plot. So we select bar here for the kind parameter. And then for each and every day we have here a bar that indicates uh, the trading volume, so the number of shares. And actually we can either denominate uh, the trading volume in number of shares 
or in US dollar value. And uh, we can actually calculate uh, the trading volume in the US dollar value by multiplying uh, the numbers, so the traded shares with uh, the price. And uh, so selecting here the daily close price is an approximation. So typically we would need uh, to select uh, the actual transaction price for each and every traded share. But uh, this is here a good approximation and uh, for some reasons and for some purposes it might be better to use uh, the trading volume in US dollar. But uh, that's beyond uh, the scope here of uh, this introduction. And uh, we will continue in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. This is a little update that I'm recording now a couple of weeks after having recorded uh, the entire section here. And uh, the reason is uh, that there was an upgrade in the Y Finance uh, package that uh, slightly changes uh, the output of uh, the download method. And actually upgrades of Python packages and libraries happen all the time. So this is nothing unusual. And it's important to be aware of that. And uh, with regard to the Y Finance uh, package, I do recommend installing the latest version at all times. And uh, upgrading a package is uh, pretty simple. So you can do this here with uh, the command pip install upgrade. So that's uh, the right command for the Anaconda prompt or for the terminal window. And then you can also check uh, your installed version with uh, double underscore version double underscore. And in my case, uh, the latest version is uh, 0 0.1.85, but uh, the Y Finance uh, library is getting updated uh, quite uh, frequently. So I guess you will see here uh, a different uh, version. And now let's go to the differences. So once again, let's uh, download uh, historical data for Apple. So when downloading daily data now, we only have the date here and uh, no time and uh, no time offset uh, with regard to UTC time. And actually whenever there's no time, then you should assume a midnight here. And uh, later we will see that uh, when downloading intraday data, so for example, hourly data, then uh, there is a time included in the download and uh, that makes sense and it's quite smart. So for daily data, we don't really need uh, the time, but for hourly data, we need uh, the time also. And uh, that's uh, what's happening here if you have installed uh, the latest uh, Y Finance version. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. We still have saved the data frame DF here with uh, historical price and volume data for Apple from 1980 until today. And uh, that's quite long. And typically when we analyze financial data, we need shorter time periods like uh, the last uh, three years or whatever. And uh, with pandas, it's pretty simple to select a specific uh, time period. So we can do this here with log and then we can determine a start date and an end date. So for example, from the 1st of January 2022 until the 15th of uh, January. And here we have, so starting here on the third, that's uh, the first trading day until the 14th. And uh, this is just one example what we can do with log. So alternatively, for example, we could also select all trading days in the year 2022. So until the very last year, the 21st of October. Or we could also say that we want to select uh, all trading days starting at the beginning of 2017 until today. So this is the first option. So downloading all available data from Y Finance and uh, then selecting the right time period with Pandas or alternatively and as a second option. So the Y Finance API allows us to customize uh, the period. And first of all, let's have a look here at uh, the website historical data for Apple. And then here we can specify the time period and uh, we can actually set here a start date and an end date. Or alternatively, we can select uh, the last one day, the last five days, the last uh, three months and so on. And uh, the same options uh, we also have here for the API. So once again, we use here the download method 
and uh, we pass uh, the symbol to the tickers parameter and then we have uh, the additional parameter start and end and by default uh, this is none but uh, we can specify start and end dates like so for example from the 1st of July 2020 until the 31st of December 2020 so this works and uh, here we have the 1st of July and uh, the 30th of uh, December 2020 and uh, this was here the first option so setting start dates and end dates or alternatively we can also select uh, periods and uh, we have a couple of valid periods so for example the last day the last five days the last uh, one month so the last 30 days and so on and uh, we can actually pass here these uh, valid periods to the period parameter and the default uh, argument is actually max and uh, we have seen before here for Apple so max starts here in the year 1980 but uh, we could also say that the last 30 days so from the 22nd of September until the 21st of October or we could say the last one year so the last uh, 365 days starting here in October 2021 and here we can see that uh, we have 252 rows for uh, one complete uh, year and uh, this means that on average so we have 252 trading days on uh, US stock exchanges like uh, the New York Stock Exchange so 252 trading days and uh, the remaining days are either weekends or bank holidays now let's move on with uh, the option uh, year to date and here we get the full year so the full current year starting on the 3rd of uh, January 2022 and finally, so we have seen this before, max is uh, the default setting and uh, here we get all available data and uh, this depends on the stock. So for Apple, the data starts here in the year 1980. So to sum up, we are completely flexible here and uh, we can select the time period that we need and uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We are back again here on Yahoo Finance and uh, the Apple stock and uh, going here one more time into historical data then we can see that uh, we not only can set uh, a specific time period but also we can change uh, the frequency. So currently we have daily data or to be more precise business daily data so without uh, weekends and bank holidays. And instead of daily, we can also select uh, weekly and monthly data. So we can apply here weekly and then we have uh, weekly uh, data. So this is uh, the last data point on the last Friday. And then uh, we have uh, always Mondays. So that's uh, last week, then the second last week and so on. Now the good news is uh, when downloading historical data via the uh, Yahoo Finance API we also have uh, the option to set uh, the data frequency and uh, there are a couple of valid intervals. So we have intraday data so from one minute to 90 minutes uh, one hour. Then we have daily data five days one week one month uh, three months. And uh, there's also the information that intraday data cannot uh, extend uh, more than the last 60 days. So we will see this. But first of all, let's simply start here. And uh, there's uh, the additional parameter interval and uh, the default uh, argument is one day. So by default, if we don't specify the interval, then we get daily data. And of course we can uh, combine interval with start, end and period. So by default uh, we get here the full data starting in 1980. And now let's move on with monthly data. So we can pass here one month. And by definition we always have here the 1st of January, the 1st of February and so on. 
so the first day of the month and uh, the interpretation is as follows so the open price is actually the very first price on the first then the close price is uh, the very last price of the last trading day so typically on the 30th or 31st and then we have monthly high prices and monthly low prices and uh, the very last row here is actually incomplete so here we have the 21st which isn't of course uh, the start of a month so we should actually remove here the very last row if uh, we uh, work here with monthly data and actually the second last row is uh, the row for October so it's uh, the running month and uh, we haven't reached uh, the end of October so the close price is actually here the price on the 21st of October so we can remove the last row and uh, we should keep in mind uh, that uh, the second last row so the current month is uh, kind of incomplete so it's only until uh, the 21st of October now let's move on with uh, weekly so we can pass here one week and uh, by definition uh, we always have here Mondays and uh, the open price is uh, the first price on Monday morning and uh, the last price so the close price is um, the price on Friday evening when markets close. So this is how we can download daily data, weekly data and monthly data and now let's move on with intraday data and uh, for example we could pull one hour data or we could try to do so and uh, here we get an error message and it says one failed download so one hour data is not available for the specific start time and end time so we cannot download one hour data from the very beginning so 1980 and uh, the requested range must be within the last uh, 730 days so we have to specify for example the period parameter or the start parameter and the 730 days means at least uh, two years so for example we could pass here one year to the period parameter to actually get hourly data starting here on the 22nd of October 2021. So that's hourly data and uh, let's move on with one minute data. So once again we could specify the last uh, one year and uh, one minute and if we try to do so we get here the message that one minute data is not available for the last year so only for the last seven days and uh, we can conclude that the higher the granularity the lower the time period that we can download here on yahoo finance so seven days means one week and uh, this should work here so now we have one minute data and uh, for example here the first bar is from 9.30 so that's uh, the price so the open price is exactly at 9.30 and uh, the close price is at uh, 9.31 and in between we have uh, the high and uh, the low price in this minute. So this is what you should know about uh, data frequency so you have many options here starting with one minute until three months thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture bye all right we are back here on yahoo finance and uh, the apple stock and uh, when we take a closer look here at uh, the chart then we can see here the price chart in blue and uh, the trading volume and also we can see uh, so-called actions like uh, dividend payouts and stocks. So D stands uh, for a dividend. And for example, here we have a dividend payout on uh, the 6th of uh, November 2014 of 11.75 cents. And also we can find the stock splits, for example, here or here. So a split uh, four to one and uh, very often students get confused by stock splits and dividends and therefore we will shed some more light on uh, those two things so stock splits and dividends in uh, the next lectures and now let's start uh, with uh, dividends 
And uh, obviously here we can see quarterly uh, dividend payouts. So here in August, in November, in January, and uh, in May. And a dividend is a distribution of profits uh, by a corporation to its uh, shareholders. So whenever a company uh, makes profit, then it can distribute uh, the profit uh, to the shareholders via a dividend payout. And actually it's important to understand uh, that uh, there are no obligations to pay dividends. So companies are free to distribute all or parts or even none of their profits to shareholders. And uh, this is also referred to the dividend payout policy. And the different companies have different payout policies depending on uh, their business and uh, their plans. And for example, in a couple of minutes, we will analyze uh, the dividend payout policy for Apple. So for you, it's important to know that uh, dividend payouts are an important source of income for equity investors. So there are actually two parts where you can or how you can generate the returns or profits when investing into stocks. So first of all, we have uh, simply the stock price increase and second, and sometimes underestimated, we have the dividend payouts and uh, as a rule of thumb, so for new and uh, innovative and high growth uh, companies, so typically the stock price increase is relatively more important because uh, typically these companies either don't generate profit, so they can't uh, distribute profits or uh, they do not want to distribute profits because either they don't have uh, any distributable profits or they prefer to reinvest uh, the profits for further growth. So that's uh, typical for new and innovative and uh, high tech or high growth uh, companies. And uh, in comparison to that, so major and or highly profitable companies typically distribute and uh, pay out um, the profits and uh, here dividend payouts can be a significant part of uh, the total return or the total profit of uh, a stock. And uh, the key message is here that uh, you shouldn't omit dividend payouts in your analysis or performance comparison because otherwise uh, you would penalize high dividend uh, paying stocks. So if you only look at uh, the price increase and omit the dividend payouts, then you penalize uh, high dividend paying stocks. Now this was uh, the theory and uh, let's see this live in action. So let's uh, download uh, dividends for the Apple stock. And uh, we have here an additional parameter in the download method. So it's uh, the actions parameter and by default it's set to false, but uh, we can also set it to true. And then we get two more columns. So here we have dividends and uh, stock splits. And uh, typically, uh, so when we have daily data, then dividends are zero because uh, typically we have quarterly dividend payouts. So once in a quarter, and therefore we should uh, filter for those days uh, where we have dividend payouts. So the last one was in August, 2022. And uh, here investors uh, received uh, 23 cents per share. And actually we can see here that uh, dividend payouts were fairly stable in the recent past. So quarterly payouts and increasing here from 22 to 23%. And uh, we can also calculate uh, the cumulative dividends since 1980. So we can sum up the dividends column and here we get 6.6 US dollar per share. So these are the cumulative dividends and uh, we can also determine the cumulative stock price increase. So from 1980 until today and here we have a profit of 147. So we can see here in this example that uh, the major part of uh, the total profit or the total return is price increase and uh, only a small part uh, of dividends. And finally, we can also analyze uh, the evolution of dividend payments over time. 
so we can uh, select the rows uh, with uh, the dividends and uh, make a plot. And uh, here we can clearly see that uh, in the earlier days we started uh, with uh, zero dividends and then dividends increased here over time, very stable. And uh, we can conclude uh, the Apple dividend uh, policy as follows. So historically uh, we have here a low dividend stock and uh, the focus was clearly on growth. So Apple reinvested uh, the profits to uh, create uh, more products and uh, to increase the growth. So that's uh, pretty typical for a high-tech uh, company. And second, uh, we can observe that dividend payouts are smooth and uh, steadily growing. So in a way they are highly predictable here. And uh, smooth means uh, that payouts are not directly linked uh, to the annual profits. So rather they are based on average profits over multiple years. And by doing so, the company avoids uh, steep dividend increases in good years and uh, dividend cuts in less profitable years. So that's an important point here, avoiding dividend cuts in less uh, profitable years. Because the dividend cuts are some of uh, the worst signals in the market indicating falling profits and uh, leading uh, to an immediate drop in the stock price. So this is what you should know about dividends and in the next lecture we will have a look at uh, the column adjusted close. So this is uh, related to, to the dividends and uh, to the total profit or total return concept. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. In this video I will explain how the adjusted close price is calculated and why and how the adjusted close price can help to better analyze stocks and their performance. And uh, we still have saved here DF and here we have uh, the columns close and adjusted close. And uh, at a first glance we can see that uh, we have identical values here in the most recent data. However, they divert in the past here. And uh, the reason is uh, that uh, the adjusted close price is uh, the backward adjusted, so to say reduced uh, close price. So adjusted for dividend payments. And now let me show you how we can calculate uh, the adjusted close price uh, given uh, the close price and uh, the dividends. So we only need uh, the three columns, close, adjusted close and uh, dividends. And uh, we save here the subset in DF2. And uh, now we can actually visualize and compare those two prices. And uh, we also plot here the dividends on the secondary y-axis. So here we have in blue the close price and in green uh, the adjusted close price. And once again here in the most recent past uh, they are identical. However, whenever there is a dividend payout then those two prices more and more divert. So the gap is growing here. And once again let's get uh, the dates uh, where we receive a dividend payment. So the first one is in May 1987 and the last one in August, so 23 cents. And uh, now let me just demonstrate how we can calculate uh, the adjusted close price around here the last date. So we simply select here the time from the 1st of August till the 5th, saved in uh, last dividend. So here on the 5th uh, we have uh, the dividend payment and uh, this is here the last day where uh, the close price and the adjusted close price and those two are identical. And then if we go into the past, then uh, they divert and uh, we could calculate here the difference. So the difference is changing from day to day, but it's around 22 or 23 cents. And uh, we can actually check uh, the methodology by clicking here on the link. And here we get a little description of the adjusted close price and how it is calculated. And then we can also open here a sample calculation. So the adjusted close price is based on a dividend multiplier. And let me just explain how this multiplier is calculated. So for the multiplier we have to take the dividend payout 
So it's uh, the 23 cents divided by the previous close price, so of the previous day, 165.80. And then we have a one minus the ratio here. And uh, this is uh, the multiplier 0.9986. And then to calculate uh, the adjusted close price back into the past, uh, we have to multiply the close price with uh, the multiplier so here we have uh, the adjusted close price calculated and here the actual close price. And uh, we should ignore here the day where we actually uh, receive uh, the dividend. So here the close price and uh, the adjusted close price are identical. But then uh, we have an adjustment uh, into the past. And if you calculate here the calculated numbers uh, with uh, the actual ones, so there is a very small difference, but uh, this is just the rounding related here. But essentially, uh, these are identical. And actually, if we go more into the past, whenever there's a dividend payout, so each and every dividend payout has a multiplier, and uh, we have to multiply the multipliers uh, with uh, each other, and uh, then, so to say, the accumulated multiplier here at the very beginning is 0 0.77 and uh, this is actually the difference between the close price and uh, the adjusted close price. So if we multiply here the close price, the 12.8 cents with uh, the multiplier of 0 0.77, then we actually get uh, the adjusted close of 0 0.1. And uh, now and most important, so how can we interpret here the adjusted close price? And uh, I have two different interpretations that are actually two sides of the very same coin. So let's assume that uh, we buy an Apple stock here in uh, the very first day, so the 12th of December 1980, then the actual price would be a 12.8 cents. However, if uh, we had decided to borrow parts of uh, the initial stock price purchase. So 22%. So we borrow 22% and just uh, pay for 78%. So that's uh, the multiplier. So we effectively pay for 78% and borrow 22%. Then we don't uh, pay 12.8 cents per share, but only 10 cents. So the adjusted uh, close price. And then we assume that uh, we pay back the borrowed amounts uh, with uh, the future dividend payments. And uh, finally today we have uh, fully repaid uh, the borrowed amounts. So this is one interpretation and uh, the other one is uh, that uh, we reinvest dividend payments. So whenever we get a dividend, then we buy more shares of Apple with our dividend. And uh, therefore to sum up, uh, the adjusted close price is pretty helpful as it is a good approximation for a stock's total return. So once again, we have uh, the price increase or the price return and uh, the dividend payments and uh, the close price only reflects the price increases and uh, the dividends uh, only reflect uh, the dividends. However, the adjusted close price includes uh, price increases and uh, dividend payments so to say all sources of income and uh, therefore it allows uh, the performance comparison across stocks with the different payout policies. And once again the key message is here that whenever we calculate and uh, compare the performance of stocks we shouldn't omit dividend payments. And uh, the adjusted close price is uh, the price that includes uh, stock price increases and uh, dividend payouts. And uh, throughout the course, uh, we will see when we should uh, work and use uh, the close price and in which cases uh, we should use uh, the adjusted close price. So we will see this in the next uh, sections. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. We still have safety F and while the most the recent prices here are those prices that can be observed on data providers like Yahoo Finance. Typically the past prices here, so for example in the 1980s, are backward adjusted prices. So backward adjusted for stock splits. 
And uh, as an example, so the real observable prices back in 1980 were not uh, 12 cents or whatever. So these are adjusted prices. And we could say that all prices, so for example, open, high, low, close prices are backward adjusted. And this means uh, reduced for stock splits. And uh, the adjusted close price is not only adjusted for dividends, but also for stock splits. And also the dividends are adjusted uh, for stock splits. Now, even if it sounds weird to work uh, with adjusted or manipulated prices, let me just clarify that uh, this makes perfectly sense. And uh, you should not question it unless uh, you are interested in historical observable prices. But typically when we analyze uh, stock performance, then we should work uh, with adjusted prices. And uh, let me explain in the next minutes why this is uh, the case here. So here in the data frame DF, uh, we have another column, the stock splits. And uh, typically it's uh, zero, so stock splits are rather rare. And uh, we can filter DF for the days where we have stock splits. So for example, here in 1987, we have a stock split two for one, then another one here in 2000, two for one, and uh, one more here, two for one, then seven for one, and uh, the most recent one in the year 2020, four for one. And now let me give you a little definition of stock splits. So a stock split allows a company to break or to split each share into multiple shares without affecting its uh, value or its market capitalization or each investor's stake in the company. So that's important. So there's actually no real effect of the stock splits. And uh, the main motivation is uh, reducing the stock price per share and uh, increase uh, the granularity. And uh, as an example, so here the most recent stock split was four for one. And uh, this means uh, that investors uh, receive four new shares for one old share. And uh, by doing so immediately, the share price uh, drops to one fourth. So there's actually a no value effect. And once again, it's important to know and understand uh, that on Yahoo Finance, prices and dividends are backward adjusted uh, for stock splits. And uh, let's have an example here. So the latest stock split in August 2020. So here we have uh, the close price 129. But uh, and uh, this is the price after the split. So 129. However, the price uh, immediately before the split is actually four times 129. So that's uh, the multiplier 516. So immediately before the stock split, an investor that uh, holds uh, one stock has actually one stock times uh, the price of 516. And then a couple of minutes uh, later after the stock split, he owns four stocks worth 129 so there's no real effect here and now let me show you how we can calculate uh, the unadjusted so the observable prices and uh, first of all on all other days uh, the uh, stock split is kind of one to one so there's no stock split but for calculation purposes we set here one where we don't have uh, stock splits and then we can calculate uh, the cumulative uh, product of uh, the stock splits column, but uh, from the latest to uh, the oldest, so in this direction. And therefore we change here the sorting to ascending and calculate uh, the cumulative product. And by doing so we get uh, the multiplier and we add here a column multiplier. And uh, by definition at uh, the most recent day, the multiplier is one. And then once uh, we have the first stock split, it increases. And finally, the multiplier here, the cumulative multiplier here in 1980 is 224. And now we can simply calculate uh, the unadjusted observable close price by multiplying the close price uh, with the multiplier. So this is just an example and uh, we could do the same here also for open, high, low and so on. So here we have uh, the unadjusted close prices. So the prices that uh, we could observe, for example, here in 1980, 
So instead of having here the adjusted uh, price of 12 cents, so the real price was the 28.7. And finally, let me explain why it perfectly makes sense to actually work with uh, the adjusted prices and not uh, with uh, the unadjusted prices. So let's plot uh, the close price and uh, the unadjusted uh, close price in one chart. Then we can see here in blue the uh, close price adjusted for stock splits. So we can see here that the stock price is uh, steadily increasing here. But if we have a look here at uh, the unadjusted graph in green, then here we can see the stock splits and uh, we see a steep decline in the price whenever we have a stock split. And we can also visualize here the stock splits in black. So here we have the first one, the second one, then another one here, here and here. However, these price drops here have uh, nothing to do with uh, the true performance. So it's just caused by the stock split. And therefore, whenever we analyze stock performance, we should actually remove uh, the effect of stock splits. And that's exactly why we have prices backward adjusted for stock splits. So these prices correctly reflect uh, the true price performance because uh, they ignore price drops caused by stock splits. So that's uh, the key message here. And finally, we should keep in mind uh, that also dividends are backward adjusted and uh, to get uh, the unadjusted dividends. Also here we have to multiply the adjusted dividends with uh, the multiplier. And uh, then also here we can actually vis visualize uh, the unadjusted uh, dividends. And also here we can see that uh, the dividend amount per share drops whenever we have a stock split here. So the unadjusted uh, dividend chart does not uh, correctly show the uh, dividend policy of Apple. So we have here an artificial drop. And finally, for the sake of completeness, if you shouldn't forget that also the trading volume as uh, the traded uh, number of shares is adjusted. And uh, here in this case, to calculate uh, the unadjusted trading volume, we have to divide the adjusted volume by the multiplier. And then also here we can visualize the trading volume in the traded uh, shares. And uh, we can see that uh, whenever we have a stock split, uh, the number of traded uh, shares jump here up. And also these jumps here are simply and just affected by stock splits. And actually uh, the effect of the stock splits uh, should be removed. So that's uh, the key message here. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In the last lecture, we have learned how we can pull historical data for US stocks or large US stocks like Apple or Microsoft. So we can simply pass here the ticker symbol to the tickers parameter of the download method like AAPL. And then we get historical price and volume data. Now, many of you might ask, how can we download data for stocks? that are listed uh, in other countries or other exchanges. So like for example, in India or in Germany. And as an example, let's uh, consider here the large uh, Indian company Reliance. And if we try to pass here the ticker symbol Reliance to tickers, then we get here the following message. So we have one failed download and uh, there's obviously no data found uh, for Reliance. So the symbol may be delisted However, the good news is uh, that uh, the symbol Reliance or the company Reliance does exist on Yahoo Finance. And uh, we can get to the data by simply adding an exchange uh, related uh, suffix. So whenever we have uh, non-US stocks, uh, we have to add an exchange uh, specific suffix and uh, we can get here the exchange list on Yahoo Finance. So here on this link, and then we can click here on market coverage. And uh, here we can see all exchanges and countries that are covered here on Yahoo Finance. So for example, we have here the US exchanges and here we do not need any suffix. So it actually works without suffix.
And actually we can find some more information here. So for some exchanges, uh, we have a data delay of, for example, 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And uh, for example, for NASDAQ, uh, the data is actually a real time. So let's move on and let's find uh, the suffix uh, for the Indian stock exchange. So we have here the national stock exchange of India and uh, the suffix is NS. So we have to add here NS and uh, the full ticker symbol is the reliance.ns. And uh, with this, we are actually able to download uh, historical price and volume data. And as a second example, let's consider the German airline Lufthansa. So the ticker symbol is LHA. And uh, in this example here, so Lufthansa is listed on uh, multiple exchanges. So it's listed on the Deutsche Börse and also on the Frankfurt uh, Stock Exchange. And uh, therefore there are two possible tickers or ticker symbols. So .de and uh, .f. So here Germany has a couple of exchanges. So for example, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange or the Deutsche Börse, etc. And uh, we can get data for both exchanges and uh, the data is slightly different. So if you compare here the prices, so they are of course very close uh, together, but still there are some minor differences. However, the largest or the most important difference is here in trading volume. So the trading volume for Lufthansa on uh, the Deutsche Börse is a lot uh, larger than here on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And uh, whenever a stock is listed on multiple exchanges, it might make sense to focus on the exchange with uh, the highest liquidity or the highest trading volume. And in this case, it's uh, clearly here the uh, Deutsche Börse. So to sum up uh, with uh, this list here, you can get uh, stocks and uh, ticker symbols for many co countries and for many exchanges. So you are not limited here to anything. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. So far we have loaded historical data for one ticker symbol only. However, the Y Finance library makes it really simple and comfortable to load multiple tickers. So we can either pass uh, one ticker symbol to the tickers parameter or we can pass a list with some multiple tickers. So for example, Apple and Microsoft. And uh, by doing so, we can simply load historical price and volume data for two or many tickers. Now Pandas coding wise, this is getting a bit more complex because uh, we have here now a multi-index uh, in the columns. So we have uh, the outer index level with uh, the price category. So adjusted close, close, high, low. And on the inner index level, we have uh, the ticker symbols. And uh, we can also check this here with uh, the info method. So here we can see the columns and uh, the multi-index. So we can also use columns and see that uh, we have here a multi-index. And actually working uh, with a pandas multi-index is a bit more complex, but still it is uh, straightforward. So we could select uh, the outer index level, so the close prices, and then we get a data frame uh, with only one level. So here we have Apple and Microsoft. And also we can select a specific column. So for example, the close price for Microsoft, and then we can do this uh, with uh, the low accessor and uh, we want to have all rows and then within parentheses uh, the outer index level and then the inner index level so the close price for microsoft but uh, there's also a simpler alternative so we can simply use here chaining so first the outer index level and then the inner index level so close microsoft and uh, this gives here the same result now there are multiple ways to actually select uh, an inner index level and uh, let me show you just the uh, one way. So we can do this uh, with uh, slice and uh, also here the log accessor, so all rows. And then in the outer index level we want to slice none and from the inner index level, for example Apple. 
And then we get here for Apple, uh, the adjusted close, close, high, low, open, and uh, volume. However, in my view, there's also a better solution. So you can uh, swap out uh, an inner index level so you can exchange uh, them with uh, the method swap level. And uh, we can actually swap uh, the two levels in uh, the axis columns. And then we can actually swap outer index level and inner index level. And now the outer index level is uh, Apple and Microsoft and uh, the inner index level is uh, are the prices here. And then having swapped uh, the levels, uh, we can simply select all prices uh, for Apple. So that's in my view, the better solution if you want to get uh, inner index level columns. Now there's one last pitfall that I want to highlight here. So when working with uh, multiple tickers uh, that contain suffixes like Lufthansa.Frankfurt or Lufthansa.de. So let's assume here that we want to get uh, the close prices for those two tickers. Then uh, we have here a data frame uh, with uh, two columns. So Lufthansa.de and Lufthansa.Frankfurt. And now if uh, you want to select uh, the Frankfurt column, then uh, the following code is incorrect. So you can't uh, use here the attributes notation. So typically you can select a column as an attribute, but uh, if uh, the column name includes a dot, then this doesn't work. And uh, you get here the error that uh, the data frame has uh, no column Lufthansa. So whenever we have special characters like a dot in a column name, then we need to use uh, the uh, square brackets indexer. So this should work. And here we have uh, the Lufthansa Frankfurt column. But uh, even better, we should remove uh, dots and other special characters from uh, column names. And uh, we could use here an underscore so we can uh, rewrite or overwrite the column names. And then we have here the ticker symbols with an underscore. And then we could also use uh, the attributes notation and get the Lufthansa Frankfurt. So this was just a little excursus here on Pandas coding. But uh, with uh, this here, you are able to download multiple tickers and also rearrange or reorganize the data frames uh, with multiple tickers. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. So far, we have downloaded the data from Yahoo Finance into Python and then we analyzed the data. But another important workflow is saving and loading the data here locally on our computer. And uh, this allows us to stop the coding session at any time and to continue the data analysis later on without the need to download uh, the data again. And uh, now let me demonstrate how this works. And one more time, uh, we load Apple data. So into the data frame DF. And uh, this is a so-called two-dimensional tabular data. So we have two dimensions. We have rows and columns, so a table. And uh, probably the best uh, file format for tabular data is uh, a so-called uh, CSV file. So CSV stands for comma separated values. And uh, we can easily write uh, pandas data frames to a local CSV file with uh, the method to CSV. And uh, most important, uh, we have to define a file name. So for example, apple.csv. And uh, now when we run the cell here, then by default, uh, Python writes uh, the CSV file apple.csv in the very same folder that uh, our Jupyter notebook that we are coding in is located. So once again, let's have a look here into the Jupyter dashboard. And uh, this is uh, the file or the folder part one materials. And here's uh, the notebook that currently I'm coding in. So equity intro part one. And now if we run here the code, we will write uh, the CSV file apple.csv into uh, this uh, folder here. So let's see this live in action. And let's check here. So let's update.
And now we can see the CSV file apple.csv and uh, we can open that uh, CSV file with uh, Jupyter and uh, here we can actually see the comma separated uh, value file and it is called comma separated because uh, the values are separated by commas. So here we have the header and uh, the column headers are simply separated by a comma and then we have the first row with uh, the date and uh, the time and uh, the prices also separated by commas. So that's a comma separated value file. And uh, we can also open here the folder on Windows. And if you have installed uh, Excel, then you can open uh, the CSV file as in Microsoft Excel CSV file. And uh, this looks like an ordinary Excel file. And otherwise, if you don't have installed Excel, then if you click on Apple, then probably you will open that file with a, so here it is, so simply comma separated values, line for line. And now let's go back uh, to the Jupyter Notebook and uh, let's uh, reload the file from the local CSV file. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the method uh, read CSV. And first of all, we actually need here the file path and it's uh, apple.csv. And by default, pandas creates here a range index and uh, now the date time index is actually a column date but uh, if you want to create or if you want to add to the data as to the index then we have to use the following parameter so index cal and here we have to pass uh, the column header date and now we have here date as an index however there's uh, still a problem so if you check here with uh, the info method Date is not a daytime index, but an index uh, with the uh, strings because uh, pandas didn't recon recognize here date as uh, a column with uh, date and time. And uh, there's another parameter here. So we have the parameter pass dates. And here we have to pass uh, the columns that we want to convert into daytime in a list. So in this case here we only have one column, so the date column that we want to pass. And now let's check again and now you should see here a date time index. And uh, this is it. So this is how we can reload the CSV files uh, with historical price and volume data. And uh, this is actually just a special case. So here we had only one symbol and now let's have a look at uh, the multi-symbol, multiple symbols case. So let's assume that we have two symbols, Apple and Microsoft. And then we have here a multi-index in the columns. So we have uh, two levels and uh, this makes it a bit more complex. So once again, let's write here this data frame into a local CSV file. And again, we can actually pass here or define here a file name, so for example, two stocks.csv. And now let's check again here. So now we have two stocks.csv and uh, loading here the CSV file with a multi index in uh, the columns uh, works a bit different. So, first of all, we have to define that uh, the first two rows are actually column headers. So, we have two levels of column headers and therefore we pass here the index positions 0 and 1 to the header parameter. And then we have to define uh, that uh, the first column, so the date column, should be uh, the index, so the column at index position 0. And also we want to pass uh, the date column. So, also here yeah, we have to pass uh, the index position. And now again, we have uh, the data frame with uh, the daytime index and uh, the two levels here. And uh, we can double check here with uh, the info method. So a daytime index with uh, a multi index here in the columns. So this is how it works if you want to save and load uh, the CSV files in the very same folder as uh, the Jupyter Notebook is located in. So you can simply use uh, file names 
like two stocks that CSV. However, if you want to write uh, the CSV file into another folder, or if you want to load a CSV file from another folder, then uh, this is getting a bit more complex. And uh, I will explain this uh, in an article that you can find in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. Now let's end uh, this uh, section with a little coding challenge and I highly recommend uh, doing uh, the coding challenge on your own before you check uh, the solution. And uh, the plan is as follows. So you should load historical price, volume and dividend data for the stocks Johnson and Johnson and for Tesla. And then you should analyze and compare dividend payments, the stock price increase since uh, the very beginning and also the dividend policy. And uh, with this, you should be able to determine which stock is uh, the high dividend paying stock. So only one of uh, these two stocks is a high dividend paying stock. And uh, I will continue now with uh, the solution. So if you want to do it on your own, then you should uh, stop the video now. Now let's uh, continue here and uh, we need Y Finance, Pandas and also Matplotlib. And then we save uh, the symbols in a list symbols. So Johnson and Johnson and Tesla. And then we can load historical price and volume data and also stock splits and dividends with uh, yf.download. And uh, we save the data frame in df. And then we can actually plot uh, the close prices to get a very first impression. And Tesla only started here in the year 2011. And uh, the history for Johnson and Johnson is uh, a lot larger here. So going back here until the 1960s. And now on the next step, we can also swap with the levels in uh, the multi-index in the columns. And uh, let's continue first of all with Johnson and Johnson. And uh, we can compare the close price and uh, the adjusted close price uh, that includes dividends. And here we can see that they deviate. So with uh, this chart, we can conclude that uh, Johnson & Johnson is paying dividends. And uh, for example, we could sum up all dividends and uh, this gives uh, 57 US dollar. And uh, we can compare this to the total price increase, $177. So we can conclude that a significant part of uh, the total return is dividends. And now we can also visualize uh, the dividend policy. So we filter the data frame for all rows uh, where we have a dividend. So typically quarterly payments. And then we plot uh, the amount of uh, the dividends. And I would suspect that uh, we have here a continuous growth. So this is uh, the case here. So the dividend payments seem to increase by a certain uh, growth factor. And uh, here we can clearly see how the dividend policy is kind of smoothed. Now we can do the same also for Tesla. And already here we can see that uh, there's no difference between uh, the close and the adjusted close. So we could suspect uh, that Tesla is not paying any dividends. So at least in the past. And uh, we can check this here. And uh, the total sum of uh, dividends is zero. And actually this is a very typical finding. So Tesla is a new and innovative company. And uh, the history of uh, generating profits is uh, rather short. So they reinvest uh, profits if uh, there are any. And in contrast to that, Johnson & Johnson is a mature company that generates profits for decades and also distributes uh, the profits or parts of it. So Tesla has paid so far no dividends, but uh, there is a huge price increase. So 156 US dollar. And uh, finally, for the sake of completeness, we can also analyze uh, the dividend policy and uh, we can see that uh, we see nothing here. And uh, we can conclude uh, without any doubt uh, that Johnson & Johnson is uh, the high dividend paying stock. Thanks for watching and see you in the next section. Bye. Hi and welcome to this very important excursus on errors and debugging. So what do you think is the most important skill in coding that any coder should have? Is it A, always coding the things uh, right uh, without errors? 
or is it B, understanding and uh, debugging errors? And uh, realistically, the first one is impossible. So if you work in code on your own projects, uh, then you will create many errors. And uh, making errors is simply part of the game. And therefore, it's even more important that you can understand and debug your errors in the shortest possible time. And uh, here's an example of an error. And uh, some of you might get intimidated by such an error message. But uh, there's absolutely no reason to throw here the towel. So it's uh, very likely that uh, you will fix uh, the problem in no time. And uh, here's another fun fact. So debugging errors can make up more than 50% of a coder's work or time in more complex projects. And uh, trial and error is a pretty good and very common approach in coding. So either you can uh, think uh, through everything before you start coding and spend a lot of time, or you can simply give it a try and code what comes into your mind first. And then you get the one or many errors and you can improve uh, the code based on the errors. And very often uh, the second approach, trial and error, is uh, the better and faster approach. And uh, that's why identifying and debugging errors is probably the learning objective number one, not only in this course, but also in any other coding course. At least it should be one of uh, the major goals. Now, the good news is that in the next uh, couple of videos, I will demonstrate and show how you can debug uh, more than 90% of your errors in less than one minute. So there are a couple of simple rules uh, that allow you to fix most of your issues in no time. And uh, there do exist advanced uh, debugging programs and uh, they can be helpful in more complex projects. But essentially you just need uh, the following. So the ability to read and uh, the ability to use the common sense. And yes, your debugging skills will improve uh, with more experience and practice. But essentially, it doesn't matter if you have just started with Python or if you are an expert. Because typically beginners are faced uh, with uh, simple beginner errors and advanced coders are faced uh, with more advanced problems. So it doesn't uh, really matter. And uh, in any case, you should be able to fix your problems. And uh, now the next lectures uh, will help you to help yourself. So thanks for watching and uh, looking forward to seeing you there. Bye. All right, in this video, you will have the chance to test and assess your debugging skills. So in the following few minutes, I will create a couple of errors and it's your job uh, to identify and understand uh, the error cause. And then you should also find a way to debug uh, the error. And uh, all questions are actually based on uh, the following simple data set organized in a Python dictionary. So here we have uh, the five most successful athletes in the Summer Olympic Games of all times in terms of medals. And uh, we have number one Michael Phelps uh, with uh, 22 medals, followed by Larissa Latinina, 18 medals. And now let's start uh, with the first error. So make yourself ready and uh, feel free to pause uh, the video if uh, you need more time. Now here we have uh, the first error and uh, we try to answer the following question. So how many medals did Michael Phelps win in his career? And uh, we get here an error and uh, you should be able now to find uh, the problem and to fix it. Now, what you see here is probably the most frequently made error, a simple typo, and uh, not only complete beginners, but also very experienced coders accidentally make typos, so you can't avoid typos, but uh, you should be able to see and fix uh, these errors in no time. And in this example, the spelling for Michael Phelps is uh, simply wrong. So here we have uh, the following structure. So we have uh, the last name, and then uh, the first name separated uh, by a comma white space. And obviously uh, we forgot here the empty or the white space. And uh, then there's also a second typo. So we mixed up E and A. So first is A and then we have E. 
And then our code is correct and uh, we get uh, 22. Now let's go back uh, to the error. And uh, most important, uh, the error message gives you many helpful information about uh, the error. So first of all, you should know that a dictionary consists of a key value pairs. So here are the keys and uh, these are the values. And uh, to get a value in the dictionary, we have to pass uh, the corresponding key. So for example, Michael Phelps to uh, the index operator, so square brackets. And uh, Python marks here the line that uh, causes uh, the error. So here in this example, we only have one line, so my dict. And then we have here Michael Phelps uh, within uh, the index operator. So we can find uh, the cause of uh, the error here in this coding line. And then it says key error Michael Phelps. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the key Michael Phelps in that spelling doesn't exist in the dictionary, which is true here. And uh, you simply know now that you have to check uh, the correct key here and uh, compare it. And then you will see that uh, the spelling is not correct. So uh, you need an empty space here to get uh, the right key. And uh, that's it. So it's uh, really simple if you know where to look at. So this was uh, the first error. And now let's uh, move on with uh, the second error. And uh, we have here question two. How many medals did Michael Phelps and uh, Takashi Ono win together? So we should uh, simply add uh, the values uh, for those two athletes. And uh, we get here a type error. And now you should uh, identify and fix uh, the problem. Now the error message tells us uh, that uh, we have a problem here in this line. Of course, in this example, we only have uh, this line and it says uh, we have a type error and uh, we try to add two numbers. So we have here an addition and uh, we have an unsupported operand type uh, for addition. So we try to add an integer and a string so it seems uh, that uh, this uh, returns an integer and uh, this uh, returns a string and uh, that's a problem here. So if you try to get uh, the value for Takashi Ono, we get a string and uh, the reason for it is uh, pretty simple if we have a look here above. So here we have uh, the key value pair for Takashi Ono and it seems uh, that uh, 13 is not an integer but it's uh, a string and that's uh, the reason uh, why we can't uh, make uh, that addition here. So we can't add an integer and a string. This uh, simply drops a type error. Now debugging the error here is pretty simple and straightforward. So you simply have to remove the quotes from 13 and then you have to rerun it. And then you get here the right result. So it's uh, 35. And now let's move on with uh, the third example. And uh, we should answer the following question here. So how many medals did Michael Phelps win more than Larissa Latinina? So in other words, uh, the difference between Michael Phelps and uh, Larissa Latinina. And uh, this is here a subtraction. And uh, we get here an error that uh, you should be able to identify and fix now. All right, mixing up uh, parentheses and uh, square brackets is a very common issue and uh, it's no problem if it's just an accidental mix up. So it happens to everyone. But in case you don't know and you don't understand the difference between uh, these two, so square brackets and uh, parentheses, then you should really improve your basic uh, Python coding skills. So that's definitely a must know. And uh, it's typically covered in the first uh, one or two hours of any Python for Beginners course. Now, square brackets are indexing operators 
that allow you to index and slice uh, values uh, in uh, data containers like uh, lists and dictionaries. And uh, that's exactly the plan here. So we want to get uh, the number of medals for Michael Phelps and Larissa Latinina and uh, so subtract uh, those values. And uh, we do it right for Michael Phelps, but uh, for Larissa Latinina, we use the parentheses instead of square brackets. And uh, typically in Python, we use parentheses to call callables like functions and methods. And uh, these are two completely different things. And uh, since uh, my dict is not a function, so it's a dictionary object, we can't call the dictionary object. And therefore, the dictionary object is not a callable. And uh, that's exactly what you can see here. So a dictionary object is not a callable. So you can index and slice a dictionary, but uh, you can't call a dictionary. So a dictionary is not a method and not a function. So this was error number three. And uh, now let's move on with uh, the last error. Now the plan is here to convert uh, the dictionary into a panda series and to store the data set in a panda series. But uh, obviously we get here an error and it's up to you to actually debug uh, the error now. Now, omitting cells or not running cells is another very frequently made mistake. And uh, it says here name error. So the name PD is not defined. And uh, you try to create a panda series uh, with pd.series, but uh, Python doesn't know PD. And therefore, you should go up and uh, see where you actually create PD. So here you try to import pandas as PD, but obviously as you can see here on the left hand side, you didn't run the cell import pandas as PD and therefore you don't import uh, the pandas library. And then if you try to convert uh, the dictionary into a panda series, it uh, simply doesn't work. So PD is simply not defined here and therefore you should uh, first of all import pandas and uh, then you can successfully create uh, the panda series, my series. So that's all here. And uh, with this we have reached uh, the end of this little self-assessment quiz. And I would say that uh, these errors are among the most commonly made errors by students. But I guess most of you will agree that uh, these are rather simple errors and uh, just as a benchmark. So experienced coders uh, will debug uh, these kind of errors in less than 10 seconds. So in case uh, you had some problems uh, with uh, the test, then uh, this is a clear signal that you have to improve your debugging skills and maybe also your basic Python coding skills. And the good news is uh, that uh, you have the chance to improve your debugging skills in the next lectures. So thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, before you can debug your error, you should understand first uh, why you get uh, that error. And I've listed here three major categories. And first, uh, and that's uh, the most relevant category, they are simply a problem in the code itself. Then second, uh, we have issues uh, with your Python installation. And third, uh, we have external factors and uh, the relevance is clearly in descending order. So most likely uh, the code is just incorrect and uh, external factors is uh, least uh, likely. So we will cover these uh, two categories later in the section. But now let's start uh, with uh, the code and either the code itself is corrupted so examples are typos, wrong indents, and inappropriate inputs. So for example, if you try to add uh, a number and a string, and second, you just omit uh, running coding lines or running cells in the wrong sequence. And uh, I will demonstrate a couple of examples uh, for uh, this here in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. Now let's start with the most frequently made errors and mistakes. And uh, maybe these errors are the hardest to debug because uh, they are so simple and nuts that you don't even expect to make such an error. But uh, good for you to know, 
every coder does simple errors. That's a part of the game and uh, that's not the problem. But it is a problem if you can't uh, easily fix uh, them. And if you ever need to ask somebody else to debug one of the following simple errors, you owe him or her a drink if you ever meet him or her in person. And in my case, as I am from Bavaria, it won't be a small drink, it uh, will be a very large drink like this one here. Just kidding, but now let's get serious and let's start with uh, the first example. And here we have a dictionary with uh, two European countries and uh, their capitals. So we have Spain, Madrid and uh, France, Paris. And once again, here we are faced uh, with a typo. And uh, this time the actual cause of uh, the error is not in the line uh, that uh, drops uh, the error. So it's in the previous line. So technically the error is in this line here because we tried to get a value for a key that doesn't exist in the dictionary. But again, the real reason or the real cause is here above in uh, the previous cell here in the data set. So I and A are simply reversed and uh, we should fix that and then it works. Next, creating typos and variable names is also very common. So we have here the variable name mydict and uh, we have here an underscore and it can happen that we just uh, forget uh, the underscore and uh, then we get here a name error. So the variable name mydict is not defined and uh, this should actually help you to find and identify the problem. So it's my underscore dict and not my dict. And uh, then we have here a similar problem. So now instead of having an underscore, we have a point. And coding wise, uh, these are two completely different things. So now Python assumes uh, that uh, we have an object uh, my stored in uh, the variable my. And then we try to call a method dict on uh, the object my. And uh, also here it says name error. So the variable name my is not defined. Now we have already seen the next error in our little quiz. So mixing up parentheses and uh, square brackets. So our plan is here to actually get uh, the value for the key Spain. And if we mix up square brackets and uh, parentheses, then of course we get here an error so uh, the dict object my dict uh, is a dictionary and it's not a callable. Now here in the next example, we forgot uh, to close the uh, quotes. So we open here the quotes, but we don't uh, close quotes. And then we get here a syntax error. So Python expects us uh, to close uh, the quote here until the end of the line, but uh, we just don't do it. And therefore we get here a syntax error. And then we can also get a typo when calling a method or when uh, trying to get an attribute. So we have here the dictionary mydict and uh, we can get all keys uh, with uh, the method keys. And then we get here Spain and France. And it may easily happen that uh, we forget here the S. So we try to call the method key and uh, this doesn't exist uh, for dictionaries. So we have here a typo in a method or function name and then we get here an attribute error. So a dictionary has no attribute or no method key. Finally, coming to the last example. So the following happens uh, quite often when students uh, transcribe the entire code from the videos. And uh, just as a side note here, this is not necessary because uh, you can download all notebooks uh, with uh, the complete code. But of course, it can be a good practice. But uh, this is also very error prone and uh, obviously here. So let's uh, run the cells and uh, we get here an error. So name error, my series is not defined. And obviously we simply forget to assign the panda series to a variable. So in other words, we forgot to save uh, the series here in memory. And in this case here, the correct and uh, full code includes here my series. So we assign uh, the panda series uh, to uh, the variable my series. 
and then it works. And uh, so thus we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. So we have covered uh, quite a lot of very simple errors, but uh, these are very common and uh, frequently made errors and uh, you should be aware of them. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now let's come to the next block of coding related errors, omitting cells, changing the sequence of cells and uh, similar problems. And uh, let's see the following example here. So we import pandas and then we create a dictionary with uh, information on five football players. And then we convert uh, the dictionary into a pandas data frame. And uh, then here initially we have a range index but uh, we can set a column here of uh, the data frame as uh, the index. And uh, for example, we can select uh, the name column with uh, the name of uh, the football players. And uh, we can set uh, the index uh, with uh, the set index method. So let's uh, first of all do it right. And then we have a data frame uh, with an index here. So we have here the football players. And then we can easily select one row and uh, one player with uh, the log indexing operator. And uh, for example, we can get uh, the row with uh, Lionel Messi. So we simply pass here the row label Lionel Messi to log. And then we get here the complete row with the nationality club world champion height and goals in the year 2018. So this is how it works if we don't omit a cell and now let's uh, restart here the kernel and uh, let's uh, run the cells. And uh, this time we just omit here the set index uh, cell. So we don't set uh, the name column as uh, the new index. And therefore, if we try to select uh, the row with uh, the row label Lionel Messi, then of course we get here a key error. So, and uh, this error message is uh, rather long, but uh, here we can see that uh, this uh, line is causing the error. And then here below we have more information on the error. So it's a key error and uh, the key Lionel Messi doesn't exist. Now, as you can see in this example, the most important part and uh, the most important information in an error message you can actually find here at uh, the very bottom here below. So it's a key error and uh, the key Lionel Messi uh, doesn't exist. And now for those who haven't worked uh, with uh, Jupyter Notebooks before, let me show you another error source. So let's close here the Jupyter Notebook and uh, let's also shut uh, the notebook down. And uh, by shutting it down, we actually delete uh, variables and uh, so on. So now if we open the notebook again, then we can still see uh, the sequence of uh, the previous coding session, but uh, this is meaningless. So now we haven't imported pandas. And now if we start here with uh, this line, then you can see that actually this is uh, the first line that uh, we have actually run. And now if we move on, then we get here a name error. So we haven't imported pandas. So we need to run here the cell again. And now let's move on with the next example. And uh, let's create a list uh, with uh, three elements, cat, dog, and elephant. And then we can append another element at the end of the list. So for example, mouse, and then we can reverse the order with the reverse method. And then animals looks like this. So we have mouse, elephant, dog, and cat. And now let's assume that we accidentally change the sequence of the cells. So let's again create animals one more time. And uh, then first of all, we reverse uh, the order and then we append mouse. Then uh, the final outcome or the final output is different. So in this case, uh, we don't uh, get an error, but uh, the data is simply different. So now animal looks different, elephant, dog, cat, and mouse. And also this can cause many problems. 
And finally, let's head to, to another example. So we had uh, omitting a cell, we had uh, changing the sequence. And finally, let's consider an example where we run a cell multiple times. And uh, first of all, let's create animals one more time with uh, cat, dog, elephant, and mouse. And now with the pop, we can actually remove uh, one element. So for example, the last element and uh, the, we can return or output uh, the element. So if we run pop only once, then we remove mouse from animals. And uh, therefore we have still three elements here, cat, dog, and elephant. And then if we try to get uh, the third element at index position two, then we get elephant. So this works uh, fine. But now it could happen that uh, we run here a cell twice. So let's uh, run it here for the first time and uh, we remove mouse. And then if we run it a second time, then we also remove elephant. And now we are left uh, with the uh, two elements, cat and dog. And if we try now to get uh, the third element, then we get here an index error. So list index is out of range. So there's no element at index position two because uh, we only have uh, two elements here. Now in all these cases, uh, debugging and fixing the problem with code is rather complex as uh, we corrupted uh, the data structure. And I don't want to say that uh, we corrupted uh, the data irreversibly, but it takes a couple of steps to uh, reverse and fix uh, the problem with code. And uh, therefore in uh, these cases, it's uh, just best uh, to restart uh, the kernel and uh, clear the output. And then we can run uh, the code in the right uh, sequence again. And then we get the right output. And it's like with a mobile phone or a computer. So if you have a coding problem and if you don't know why you have that problem, then shutting it down and restarting it uh, very often helps and uh, fixes uh, the problem. So thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. We have already seen one or two index errors and now let's see some more examples. And uh, in most of my courses, I work a lot with pandas data frames and also with pandas, uh, you can uh, create index errors. So let's have an example and let's again create uh, a data frame with uh, five football players. So essentially uh, we have here six columns and five rows and uh, then we can perform position-based indexing on a data frame with uh, the ilog operator. And uh, for example, we can get uh, the seventh column at index position six. And uh, as uh, we only have six columns, we get here an index error and it says that uh, the single positional index is out of bounds. So we don't have uh, seven columns. And likewise, we can also try to get uh, the sixth row with ilog five, so at index position five. And as uh, we only have uh, five rows, we get another index error here. So these are data frames. And uh, the same we can also do with lists. So again, we have uh, the list animals with four elements. And if we try to get uh, the fifth element at index position four, then also here we get an index error. So the list index four is out of range. And uh, we can also perform here negative indexing. So we could try to get uh, the fifth last element with minus five. And also here as uh, we only have four elements, so we get here an index error. And finally, let me shed some more light on typical index error causes. So very often you will find uh, the actual reason for the error, not in uh, the line that actually uh, drops uh, the error, but in one of uh, the previous cells. And uh, let's have a look at an example here. So we have uh, the list names uh, with four names, John, Paul, Mary, and Anne. And uh, then uh, we try to get all names uh, starting with an A, so in capital A with a for loop here. So we create an empty list, my list, and uh, we try to save all names starting with an A here in my list. So we iterate over names 
And if uh, the first uh, element in the name is equal to capital A, then we append uh, the name to my list. And now if we run the cell here, we have updated my list. And uh, now if you want to get uh, the very first name starting with an A, then uh, we get here an index error. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. So my list is uh, still empty. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. So none of uh, the names here start uh, with a capital A. So we have N here, but uh, we have a lowercase a. And uh, there are actually two ways how we can fix uh, the problem. So either we capitalize uh, the names or we use here a lowercase a. And now if we rerun here the code, then we get N. And uh, once again, please note that very often uh, you need to inspect uh, previous cells to identify and debug the error. So let's again create uh, the error here. And now if you only inspect the line that drops uh, the error, then uh, there's no chance to actually uh, see uh, the cause or the reason for the error. So we have my list and uh, zero and uh, this looks okay. And the students tend to focus only on the very last line that uh, drops uh, the error. And uh, if uh, they create a screenshot only here with uh, the very last line and ask why they get an error here, then uh, there's actually no chance uh, to, to help here. So what uh, we can say here that obviously my list is an empty list, but uh, we can't say anything about uh, the reason for it. And uh, there's no chance to fix uh, the problem here and uh, to debug the error without inspecting the previous cells. So please keep in mind, uh, you should also inspect uh, the previous cells to identify and debug the error. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Setting the right indents and debugging indentation errors can be a challenging task. So imagine a very complex code with nested uh, for loops and if elif statements. Indentation can be a real pain, but uh, the general mechanics are always uh, the same. And essentially two things can go wrong here. So either you create an unexpected indent uh, where there shouldn't be any, or you forget to set a required indent. And uh, now let's have a look at two examples here. So here we create uh, the dictionary with uh, two key value pairs. And uh, then we have here a second line in this coding cell. So we simply return my dict. And actually when working in uh, Jupyter Notebooks, whenever you have multiple lines in one coding cell, so here we have two lines, then you have to care about indentation. And uh, for example, if uh, you create a simple uh, white space or empty space here in the second line, then you get here an indentation error. So Python views uh, this here as an indent and uh, there shouldn't be any indent here. And also if you create a kind of a real indent with the tab key, then you get here the indentation error so both lines here in our coding cell should start at uh, the very beginning here and then it works. And uh, just as a side note, so if you only have uh, one line here in one cell, then uh, it is uh, less restrictive. So you can create here a white space or you can create a full indent with uh, the tab key. So it still works. But of course, uh, creating here an indent uh, that is not required is uh, definitely a bad habit, so don't do it. So this was uh, the example where we created an unexpected indent. And now let's move on to an example where we need an indent. And uh, the best example is actually a for loop. So we can iterate over my dictionary and uh, we can print uh, key value pairs with uh, my dict.items. So there we create uh, tuples with uh, the key value pairs and then we can simply print uh, key value pairs. So let's uh, run here the cell and uh, here we get uh, Spain Madrid and uh, France Paris and uh, Python automatically creates here an indent if we press uh, the enter key after the colon. And now if we accidentally remove uh, the indent, 
then uh, we get here another indentation error. So uh, uh, Python expected here an indented block, but uh, we have no indent here and therefore we should uh, create one. So this was a brief overview on indentation errors, but again, it can be a lot more complex. But again, uh, the general mechanics and uh, the reasons for errors are always uh, the same. So either you create an unexpected indent or you forget a required indent. So that's it. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures. Bye. All right, the misuse of Python keywords and uh, build-in function names is another no-go in Python coding that can cause many problems. And uh, let's see two simple examples here. So let's uh, create a tuple my tuple with uh, the elements uh, 0, 1, 2 and 3. So here we have uh, the tuple my tuple and uh, then we can convert a tuple into a list uh, with uh, the Python build-in function list and uh, so we can simply pass here my tuple to list and uh, create my list. So this works perfectly. And now the following is a very frequently made error because it's always beneficial to use uh, meaningful and self-explanatory variable names. So intuitively it makes a lot of sense to assign a list uh, to the variable name list. So let's assume that uh, we want to create a list uh, with the elements four, five, six, seven then intuitively you could assign uh, this list here to the variable name list. And uh, you can do that here and it works, but as a consequence, you actually overwrite the uh, list as a function. And now if you try to convert uh, my tuple one more time to a list by using a list, then you get here an error because the list is no longer a built-in function. So it's just uh, the list object with uh, the elements four, five, six, seven, and a list object is not callable. So list is a Python built-in function, but uh, the simple rule applies also for other Python functions. And uh, now let's move on to Python keywords. And uh, the good news is that typically you can't misuse Python keywords like for, break, continue, or whatever as a variable name. So if you try to do so, you get a syntax error. And as an example, if you try to save a list with uh, three Formula 1 drivers in uh, the variable name for, then it won't work here. So you get a syntax error. And actually you might have observed that here in Jupyter Notebooks, Python keywords and also function names are highlighted in green. So if you see something highlighted in green, then you shouldn't try to misuse that as a variable name. And uh, that's all you have to know here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. In this lecture, we will cover type errors and value errors. And at a first glance, uh, these error types seem to be similar, but uh, there's uh, one major difference. So a type error is raised whenever an operation is performed on an incorrect or unsupported object type. And in contrast, a Python value error is raised when a function receives an argument of uh, the correct type, but an inappropriate value. And now let's simply have a look at uh, some examples here. And uh, let's start uh, with the type errors. So we say here three as an integer and uh, four as a string in uh, the variable names a and b. And now if we try to add a and b, then uh, we get a type error. So we can't add an integer and a string. So this is simply not defined. And likewise, uh, we could also create uh, a string with uh, three fractions. So let's uh, assume that uh, we want to create the message a present for you. And uh, we have a present in A, then we have uh, the integer four saved in B, and finally we have uh, U in C. And then if we try to concatenate the, the strings into one message, then also here we get a type error. So we can't uh, concatenate the uh, string and integers, so we can only concatenate string and string. And uh, for example, we could turn here the integer into a string and uh, then it works, a present for you. So these were two examples for type errors. So we try to perform an operation with uncorrect or unsupported object types. And now let's move on with value errors. 
And uh, for example, we could turn a string into an integer. So for example, the string five, and then we have here now the integer five. So we can pass the strings to the function integer, but uh, this only works if uh, in the string, uh, Python can find a number. And uh, for example, doc is an example that doesn't work. And in this example, we get here a value error. So we have here an invalid uh, string and uh, we can't pass here doc uh, to integer. Next, let's create uh, the list my list uh, with uh, three elements, cat, dog, and mouse. And uh, then we can remove an element uh, with uh, the remove method. So generally we can pass here a string to remove, but uh, if we pass uh, a value that is not in the list, for example, elephant, then uh, we get here a value error. So X elephant is not in the list. And finally, let's conclude uh, this video with a math example. So first of all, let's import math. And uh, then with uh, the method square root, we can calculate uh, the square root uh, for a number. So for example, four, and uh, the square root of four is for example two. But now if we try to pass a negative number, so for example, minus one, then uh, we get here a value error. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. So we can't calculate uh, the square root for a negative number. This is mathematically not defined unless uh, you are in the world of complex numbers, but uh, that's a completely different story. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In one of the first videos, I said that coders just need uh, the ability and even more important, the willingness to read carefully and to use common sense to fix most of their coding issues. And uh, that's definitely true. So I guess you agree that uh, the errors and uh, the error messages, which uh, we have seen so far, were pretty intuitive and simple to understand. But of course it can happen and it will happen that you don't understand an error. And in this case, Google and uh, stackoverflow.com are pretty much your best friends. And uh, if you haven't heard of it yet, so Stack Overflow is a, if not uh, the community for coders. And uh, there you can find the questions and answers to pretty much any coding problem that exists. So it's uh, very likely that uh, you will find an answer to your question there. And if not, uh, you can create an account on Stack Overflow and uh, raise your coding issues there. And uh, typically you will get fast and uh, multiple responses uh, there. Now, good news is uh, that you can read in the Stack Overflow community without an account. And uh, now let's have an example here. So a pandas example. And uh, this example is maybe less intuitive and less simple to fix at uh, least for beginners. So let's import pandas and uh, let's create uh, a dictionary with uh, five football players. And let's uh, turn the dictionary here into a data frame. And uh, now the plan is to get uh, the three tallest players. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the pandas data frame method n largest. So we can go here inside with shift tab and uh, essentially we have here two major parameters, n and columns. And n largest actually returns uh, the first n rows ordered uh, by the column that you need. So in our example, n should be three and uh, the column of interest should be the height. And now if we run the cell here, we get a syntax error and it says positional argument follows keyword argument. Now, if you haven't heard of that before, and if you don't know the difference between a keyword argument and a positional argument, then it's uh, pretty hard to understand this error here. But uh, what you can do, you can simply copy and paste uh, the error and uh, paste it here into Google. And uh, very likely you will get many results. And for example, here we have uh, the statement, uh, the error positional argument follows keyword arguments means that if any keyword argument is used in the function call, then it should always be followed uh, by keyword arguments. 
So still, this is not really useful if you don't know what a keyword argument and a positional argument is. And uh, typically you find uh, more results from Stack Overflow. So uh, this question has been asked uh, multiple times before on Stack Overflow. And let's simply go to one instance here. And uh, obviously here's one coder that experienced uh, the positional argument follows keyword argument problem. And then here we have a very good answer. So this user says that uh, there are two types of arguments when we run a function or a method, positional and keyword. And uh, for example, let's uh, create a user defined function where we simply add two integers or two numbers a and b, and then we can call the function uh, only with positional arguments. So for example, four plus four gives eight, or we can use keyword arguments. And if you use keyword arguments, uh, we explicitly use here the arguments. So a equals four and b equals four. And uh, before we had positional arguments, so Python knows and assumes here that uh, this four is addressed to a and this four for b. And uh, both alternatives work here. So you can either use only positional arguments or keyword arguments, but uh, there are two more options. And uh, very often it is uh, the case uh, that in a function or in a method, you know the very first parameter and uh, then you simply pass here the first argument to the first parameter as a positional argument. And then for the next arguments, uh, you use uh, keyword arguments and uh, this is totally fine, so also this option works. But uh, now if you try to start with a keyword argument followed by a positional argument, so this doesn't work. So whenever you use your first keyword argument, then you can only continue with uh, keyword arguments. So if a positional argument follows a keyword argument, then uh, this uh, drops an error here. And uh, what we can simply do, we can now use here two keyword arguments. So we can add here columns and then we get uh, the three tallest players. Or alternatively, we can use a positional argument followed uh, by a keyword argument. Or last but not least, uh, we can only use the positional arguments. So in this case, this works. Now to sum up here in this case, uh, we didn't know and we didn't understand uh, the problem, but uh, for the vast majority of coding problems, uh, you will find an answer or the stack overflow or with uh, Google in general. And in our case, it uh, took us uh, two minutes or so. So stack overflow is a great tool and uh, a must have for any coder. And uh, so thus we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. We have seen before that very often the reason for an error is not in the line that actually drops the error message. So it's somewhere in the previous code and in more complex projects with more complex code, that is actually the normal case. But uh, we don't have to go through hundreds or thousands of coding lines to find the problem because Python helps us to trace back the error. So in one of uh, the earlier videos, I said uh, that uh, the error message contains a lot of helpful information. And uh, so far we just uh, scratched uh, the surface here. And now let's uh, consider a more complex example. And uh, let me just use a trading strategy backtesting example. So we need a couple of packages and libraries like pandas, numpy and matplotlib. And then we have here the class con backtester, so that's a class for the vectorized backtesting of simple contrarian trading strategies. And uh, we have here quite a lot of methods and many coding lines. And now let's define here the class. And uh, probably you haven't uh, seen this code before and at a first glance uh, you don't understand too much here. But uh, the key message is it doesn't matter because Python allows you to trace back an error in no time. And uh, at least you can localize and narrow down the problem. And uh, finally, you can say, okay, this method or even this single line of code causes uh, the problem. And uh, that's actually pretty great. 
So let's uh, go on here with our example. And uh, first of all, we need some inputs for our backtest. And then we create an instance of uh, the con backtester class uh, with uh, the inputs saved in tester. And then we uh, run here one method of uh, the backtester class, the test the strategy method. And uh, we pass here the argument 51 to the Windows parameter. And uh, now when calling the method here, Python uh, drops an error message. So we have here an attribute error. And uh, the error message or the traceback here is rather long. And actually Python prints uh, this message here or this traceback when an error is uh, raised in, in our code. And uh, it can be overwhelming here for beginners, but uh, the Python traceback has uh, a wealth of information that can help you to identify the cause of uh, the error. And understanding what information a Python traceback provides is uh, vital to becoming a better Python coder. Now we can always find uh, the most important and the most helpful information here at the bottom. So here we can see uh, the type of the error in an attribute error and uh, some more specific and helpful information for understanding the reason. So it says here that uh, the con backtester class object has no attribute TP here. So that's uh, pretty helpful. And then here above uh, we can actually trace back the error. So we can see here a sequence of calls from the oldest to the latest call. And uh, you can either analyze uh, the traceback from the top to the bottom, so from the oldest to uh, the latest, or from the bottom to the top. And it depends on the case, and it is also a matter of taste. But here in this example, I would prefer to start here at the top. And uh, before we start, uh, we should go here to view and toggle line numbers and uh, Python creates here line numbers for each and every cell. And uh, obviously we get here an error when we call the method test strategy. So in uh, this uh, Python uh, module, which means here in uh, this Jupyter notebook in line five or cell five, when calling the method test strategy, and uh, therefore to further understand uh, what was going wrong, we have to go inside uh, the test the strategy method and uh, we actually call or define test strategy here in this Jupyter notebook in a line or in cell two. So this is cell two where we define uh, the class and uh, we have to go to line 92 where we call the method print performance in this test strategy method. So let's go here up to line 92. So here we have uh, the test the strategy method and in line 92, we call the method print performance. And then we go further down the road inside uh, the method print performance that we can also find here in cell two. And then inside print performance, we have line number 200, where we actually try to calculate the annualized mean. And uh, we do this by calling the method calculate annualized mean. And it seems uh, that uh, here's uh, the problem actually. So let's go up again to line 200 here inside print performance. And uh, here's uh, the problem. So here we call calculate annualized mean and uh, there might be a problem in this method. So let's go down again. And uh, then here in the next step, uh, we are in the method calculized annualized mean. And also this we can find here in cell two and uh, then we should go to line 239 to uh, this uh, coding line where we actually uh, return and uh, calculate uh, the annualized mean. So now let's go to 239. And uh, the problem is uh, that uh, we try to get here the attribute TP year, but uh, this doesn't exist.
Now here we have the method calculate annualized mean and uh, line 239 and uh, here's uh, the problem. So we try to get uh, the attribute TP here and uh, this doesn't exist. And uh, if you look here around, then it seems uh, that uh, the attribute TP under slash year exists and it seems to be a simple typo. And uh, we can also go here up and then we can see that uh, we create the attribute the TP under slash year already here in the Dunder init method. So this was a simple typo. And uh, just by using here the traceback, we can actually localize uh, the error. So starting at test strategy, then we go down to print performance, then to calculate annualized mean. And finally, we find uh, the line that actually causes uh, the error. And in this case, it's a simple typo. So we have to add here or include uh, the under slash and that's all. So now let's rerun here the cells and let's redefine the class. And let's again run the back test. And this time uh, we get here a nice printout with uh, the performance measures of our strategy here. Finally, let's have another example where a package or library is included. So in our case now, the pandas library. So I've added an error in the code uh, that actually touches uh, the pandas library. And uh, let's again run here the cells. And now let's run here the back test and uh, we should get another error. So it's uh, once again an attribute error and uh, we start here with uh, the method test strategy. Then uh, the traceback leads us to print performance and uh, then again to calculate annualized mean. And also here the problem is in line 239. And uh, now in the next step, we go inside uh, the pandas uh, library and uh, there we find uh, the problem in line 5465. So there's no need to go inside uh, a package or library, for example, a pandas library. But it says here that a panda series object has no attribute or no method M A E N. So it should be mean, but uh, there's a spelling error. And uh, we find that error here in line 239 here in this row. And it seems uh, that uh, we have here just a simple typo. So let's go up. And then let's correct uh, the error here. So series.mean. And then we can run here the code. And uh, we have successfully uh, debugged the error. Now, as you can see, you can debug or at least localize and narrow down uh, the reason of an error, even if you don't uh, know and understand uh, the underlying code. So you can simply trace back the error and uh, say that, okay, in this uh, line of code or in this method, we actually have uh, the reason for the error. And uh, that's uh, actually a pretty great finding here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, corrupted code is uh, the major reason for errors. But sometimes while the code itself is correct, there could be a problem in the Python installation and uh, we can actually identify three different issues. So first of all, uh, we have missing packages or libraries in the installation. Then second, we have old or outdated versions. And third, uh, we have uh, an corrupted installation. So for example, multiple conflicting installations or inconsistencies in the installation. And uh, now let's uh, move on uh, with uh, the simples problem. So missing packages and libraries. And actually many packages and libraries are already pre-installed in the full Anaconda installation. So we have here uh, the important data science uh, libraries, pandas, numpy, matplotlib, scipy and seaborn and uh, many more. And uh, if you have a full Anaconda installation, then uh, you shouldn't have any problems to import them. And uh, if you have problems, then this is a clear signal that uh, there's a severe issue with your Anaconda installation. So maybe you have installed uh, Miniconda, 
which is only a minimum installation. And uh, I do recommend to actually install the full Anaconda installation. Then you shouldn't have any issues to import uh, these packages and libraries. And second, uh, there are more packages and libraries uh, in the Conda list, but not necessarily pre-installed. So for example, the Pandas data reader, and uh, you can install the Pandas data reader with uh, the command uh, Conda install Pandas data reader. So you have to enter this command into Anaconda prompt or a terminal window if you are working on Mac. So this is here Anaconda prompt as I'm working on a Windows machine. And second, if you want to install packages and libraries that are not in the Anaconda list, then you have to install them with the command pip install and uh, then the package name. So for example, fxcmpy. Now the Twitter package is another package that we have to install with pip install and uh, currently I haven't installed the Twitter and now if I try to import it uh, with the import Twitter then I should get an error here and it's uh, the module not found error so no module or no package named Twitter and uh, this is a clear sign or indication that uh, you simply haven't downloaded and installed uh, that package or library. And in this case, I could install Twitter with uh, the command pip install Twitter. So I don't uh, run it now. Now, Mac users uh, frequently contact me and say that uh, they have installed a package uh, with pip install, but uh, they can't uh, find it uh, in Anaconda and uh, they get uh, the module not found error and uh, all these uh, Mac users have uh, one thing in common. So they do have uh, two or many separate and conflicting Python installations installed. And typically it's uh, one full Anaconda installation and a default uh, Python 3.x installation. And uh, what's going wrong here? So if they try to enter the command pip install package name in the terminal, then by default um, it adds the package to the default Python 3.x installation and not to the full Anaconda installation. And uh, there's a workaround for this, but it's rather complex and error prone. And therefore my clear message is here. So either you can handle multiple installations and uh, fix uh, those problems that are a direct consequence of it, or you can't handle it and then you should avoid uh, multiple installations. Now, generally when talking about installation problems, avoiding is better and more simple than debugging. So you can avoid installation problems by carefully installing and maintaining and updating a sound installation. And uh, this includes among others, following uh, the installation steps uh, that you can find in the course. And uh, for example, you should avoid parallel installations, in particular when uh, working on Mac. And uh, then in the next step, uh, you should frequently update your installation with uh, the commands conda update anaconda and conda update conda. And uh, you can also upgrade or update packages and libraries that you have installed uh, with pip with uh, the command pip install the package upgrade. And uh, alternatively, if it's uh, just a missing or a outdated package, then you should try to install or update that package. But uh, in case you get errors and problems in the prompt or in the terminal here, when uh, you try to install or update a package, then uh, this is a clear signal for a corrupted installation with uh, inconsistencies and more. And at this point, it's getting really difficult to find the problem from the distance. And uh, what you can actually do here, so you can try to check on Stack Overflow for uh, these errors. But in my experience, it's typically the fastest solution to fully remove and uh, reinstall your installation. So that's uh, the ultimate solution that always works. And uh, with uh, this final word, we are here at the end of this lecture and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.
We have already covered code issues and the problems uh, with uh, the Python installation. And now the third category is external factors. And uh, these external factors can lead to problems and uh, coding errors. And uh, typically external factors can play a role when communicating with web APIs or when uh, scraping data from websites and servers uh, with Python and uh, loading financial data from the web or making orders and trades uh, with an online broker or trading platform is a good example for this. And uh, a couple of things can go wrong here. So there could be a weak and uh, corrupted internet connectivity and also on the other side, the server errors. So if you try to pull data from, for example, Twitter and uh, the Twitter servers down, then you can't do anything here. Next, we have authentication issues. And uh, sometimes you need the login credentials like an API key to connect and uh, errors could arise if uh, the key is incorrect or expired. Then moving on to eligibility issues. So in some countries and locations, uh, some API calls uh, are prohibited. So for example, buying cryptocurrency futures and in case you are located in such a country, then you simply get an error if you try to actually call or use uh, these prohibited API calls. And finally, students who code uh, with a company device uh, from time to time report firewall issues or admin right issues. And uh, this could lead uh, to the situation that uh, some API calls are getting blocked. Or it could also happen that uh, students can't install certain Python packages and libraries uh, due to admin right issues. So these are the major problems caused by external factors. And now let me just uh, drop some more thoughts on this. So typically external factors and errors caused by these factors pop up when using web API related or more special libraries such as uh, requests. Y Finance, Alpha Vantage, FXCMPy, TPQA, V20, Python Binance, CCXC, Excel Wings, and more. So, this is just a small selection of special packages and libraries that I use in my courses here. And actually, some problems and errors caused by external factors are beyond uh, the coders and also beyond my control. So, for example, server downs. So, you and I, we can't do anything if uh, the Twitter server breaks down. Now, the most important question is how to debug such errors. And uh, typically there's no one fits all solution, but uh, I do highlight the frequent problems in the course and uh, you should carefully watch um, those videos and uh, check uh, the previous and also the next lectures if you have a problem in one lecture. So typically I add uh, special trouble shooting lectures from time to time that uh, actually address uh, student problems. And uh, the title of these lectures actually contain uh, the word troubleshooting, so you can't actually miss uh, those lectures. And finally, you should uh, search in the Q&A board for similar issues. So typically problems caused by external factors uh, pop up from time to time. And it might be the case uh, that uh, your fellow students already asked uh, this uh, question or addressed uh, this problem in the Q&A board. And last but not least, and I guess uh, this is a no-brainer, but anyway, so for those who work uh, with a company device and get uh, restricted by firewall issues, admin rights or company guidelines or whatever, so there isn't anything I can do here for you. And in all these cases, uh, you should talk to your company's IT or the legal department. So thanks a lot and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. In this lecture, we will repeat and sum up what we have learned in this section. And I will provide a very helpful debugging flowchart. So if you follow the steps carefully, then it's very likely that you will be able to debug the error in just a few minutes or even seconds. And uh, now let's start uh, with uh, the error. And uh, the error could be a true error with an error message or alternatively an unexpected output. So the flowchart uh, works in both cases. And uh, if your code drops an error, then first of all, you should read uh, the error carefully. And uh, we have seen before that the most informative part is at the bottom. So there you will find uh, the error type and more details. 
And in many cases, uh, this is sufficient uh, to identify and fix uh, the issue. And uh, if not in the next step, you should inspect your code. And it's important to also include previous cells. So typically the coding line that drops uh, the error does not cause uh, the error. And uh, you can use uh, the error message to trace back the error. Now, if uh, that doesn't help, uh, you should then restart the kernel and run all cells in the right sequence. And in many cases, uh, this fixes uh, the problem. Finally, in case uh, your error is related to, to the cost content, then uh, you should uh, download and run uh, the cost notebook. And again, this is available for download. And if uh, that works, then there is a coding error in your code and uh, you should then compare it uh, to find uh, the problem. And after this step here, if it still doesn't work, at least uh, you can be pretty sure that uh, the code itself is correct. So there's uh, not a problem in the code itself. So there could be a problem with your installation. And of course, if uh, the error type is a module not found error, then already here, at uh, this step, you know that uh, it must be something with your installation. And in any case, uh, you should keep your installation up to date. And sometimes a simple update uh, with uh, the command conda update anaconda fixes uh, the problem. And if not, uh, you should uh, copy the error and uh, make a Google search and also search on uh, Stack Overflow. And if uh, also this doesn't help, then you should uh, rewatch uh, the video and maybe you have missed anything. And uh, you should also check uh, the previous and the next lectures. So sometimes you can find a troubleshooting lecture directly before or after a lecture. And finally, if all that doesn't work, you should go to the Q&A board, so the course Q&A board, and check uh, the board for similar questions and problems. And in particular, you should check uh, the questions attached to that lecture where you have the problems. And uh, in case you don't find uh, similar questions, then feel free to create a new one. And uh, that's uh, the debugging flowchart. And uh, I guess you will be able to fix most of your errors within uh, one or five minutes. And uh, here the full process until and including the steps shouldn't take longer than 20 to 30 minutes. Now with uh, regard to Q&A bot questions, my team and I, we uh, do our best to answer questions uh, within uh, two to four business days. But uh, in reality, in particular, when dealing with errors, it uh, can take longer, so a week or even more, because uh, very often important information is missing. And then we have to turn loops and ask you for more information. So that's uh, not only for you, but also for us a waste of time. And therefore, if you need our help, then you should provide uh, the following information in your question. So your question must contain the following information. So first of all, the lecture number or the lecture title and uh, your question should be attached to the relevant lecture and then a brief uh, description. So maybe one or two sentences. And uh, then most important, uh, you should attach a screenshot with uh, your code. And uh, keep in mind uh, that also the previous coding lines are important. And uh, then even more important, uh, we need the full error message. So don't cut uh, the error message because uh, the most informative parts are at uh, the very bottom. Then next, you should confirm that uh, you get uh, that error also when uh, running uh, the cost notebook. So you should download uh, the notebook and uh, run uh, the notebook. And then you should confirm that uh, you still get uh, the error with uh, the correct code. And uh, by doing so, we make sure that it's actually not the code uh, that causes uh, the problem here. Next, you should provide uh, some more information on your installation. So for example, uh, the Python 3.8 version and also for other involved packages. So if uh, you code with pandas and the pandas uh, drops an error, then you should provide uh, the pandas version. And of course you should make sure that uh, you have an updated installation. 
And uh, also the operating system can help. So there are minor differences between uh, Windows, Mac and Linux. And uh, this is an optional point here. So if uh, the error and uh, the question is uh, related to API calls and uh, in particular to algo trading activities, then it's uh, important to know your location. So maybe uh, you are trading or you try to trade from a location that is actually a prohibited location. So that's an important information. And finally, uh, you could also provide other measures that uh, you have taken to fix it. So for example, relevant uh, Google search results or stack overflow links. And uh, with all that information, you will get a proper answer within two to four business days. And uh, thanks for your cooperation in advance. And uh, with this, we have reached uh, the end of uh, this section. And uh, once again, if uh, there's one thing where many students have uh, insufficient skills, then it's uh, the ability to handle and debug coding errors. And in reality, that is a must-have skill if you ever want to work on more advanced projects. So with uh, this section here, I hope I contributed uh, to make you a better coder. Thanks for watching and see you in the next sections. Bye. All right, let's move on with part two of the equity analysis introduction. And uh, so far we have loaded and analyzed historical price and volume data and also dividends. But uh, there's of course many more information about, about a company and about a company stock. And uh, we can see this here on Yahoo Finance. So again, we have here the Apple stock and uh, we actually already have covered here historical data. But uh, here under summary, for example, we have for the market capitalization or here under statistics, evaluation measures, financial highlights, share statistics and more, and also financials. And uh, the good news is that we can download most of the data here with uh, Python and uh, the Yahoo Finance API. And uh, the tool of choice is here the ticker object. But first of all, once again, we need to import uh, Y Finance, Pandas, and also Matplotlib. And uh, for plots, we use uh, the Seaborn style. And then we can actually create a ticker object uh, for a specific uh, ticker symbol. So for example, Apple. And uh, this is now here a ticker object. And uh, the ticker object allows us not only to load uh, more detailed data, but also the historical price and volume data. So there's uh, the method history. And here we can get uh, once again, historical price and volume data. And uh, the only difference is here that uh, the default parameters are slightly different. So for the period parameter, we have here one month and uh, still the interval is one day. So by default, uh, we get here the historical price and volume data for the last month. And uh, here we already have uh, dividends and stock splits. So that's uh, the second alternative, how we can load historical price and volume data. But uh, there's many more we can find here. And uh, probably uh, the most important method is uh, get info. And here we get uh, data organized in JSON format. So you can see this here with uh, the dictionary. And uh, for example, here we get information on the industry sector, so technology, full-time employees, then here a long business summary. So the Apple company designs, manufactures and markets smartphones and so on. And a lot of metrics and numbers here. And actually we could convert uh, the dictionary here also into a panda series. So let's say for the panda series an info. So here we have for the first five elements and the last five elements. And uh, with the head method, uh, we can expect for example, the first 50 elements. So in total, we have here 153 elements. And uh, for example, here we have a phone country and a lot of financial metrics like EBITDA margin, profit margins, and so on. And in the next lectures and sections, uh, we will cover many, but of course, not all of uh, these uh, metrics and uh, information here. 
And finally, you can also check here what else you can do with a ticker object. So by clicking here on uh, the tab key, you can get here a drop down menu. So you can get earnings, balance sheet, financials, and so on. And uh, we will cover many of them in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this lecture, we will cover very important concepts like uh, share price, shares outstanding, and uh, market capitalization, and how these metrics uh, relate to each other. And uh, the key message of uh, this lecture is that uh, the absolute share price of a stock, so for example, for uh, the Apple stock, it's currently 151. So the absolute price per one share is not really a meaningful metric on a standalone basis. So if the price of one Microsoft share, for example, is uh, around about twice as much as uh, one share of uh, the Apple stock, then this doesn't mean that uh, the Microsoft stock is better or the value of Microsoft is higher or whatsoever. So you simply can't draw any such conclusion here because uh, this is just uh, the price of one share. And uh, the interesting question is how many shares at uh, that price uh, do exist? And uh, this leads us to the very important concept of market capitalization. So we still have saved here the Panda series info. And one of the info is here the market cap. So we can directly get to the market cap with market cap. And uh, this is a pretty large number. So it's 2.43 billion US dollar. So we can actually see this here. So I think that's uh, the market cap. Uh, at uh, the end of uh, the last uh, trading day. And uh, this is uh, the current market cap. So what's uh, the market cap? So the market cap refers to the total market value. And if uh, we are dealing here with a US stock, then it's uh, the total dollar market value of a company's uh, outstanding shares. So the total value of all shares and uh, we can also say that the market capitalization refers to how much a company's equity is worth as determined by the stock market. Or to put it simply, so if you want to buy all shares of Apple, then you need 2.43 billion US dollar. Now to calculate a company's market cap, we simply have to multiply the number of outstanding shares. So the shares uh, that exist by the current share price. And uh, the good news is uh, that uh, we can get uh, the outstanding shares here from info. So with the shares outstanding. And uh, here we have 16 uh, billion shares. So quite a lot of shares. And actually shares outstanding refer to a company stock currently held by all its shareholders. So it includes the uh, share blocks held by institutional investors and also restricted shares owned by the company's officers and insiders. And uh, last but not least, we can also get uh, the current share price with the uh, current price. And uh, this is 151.18. And now let's double check here the formula. So the market capitalization is uh, the sh shares outstanding times uh, the share price. And if we uh, rearrange uh, the formula here for uh, the share price, then we have uh, share price equals market cap divided by the number of shares. And uh, also here we get 151.18. So once again, the share price alone is not a meaningful metric to compare stocks. It's all about uh, the combination of share price and outstanding shares. So the market capitalization and uh, we have learned before that uh, the share price can be changed or manipulated, for example, simply by a stock split. So for example, in a stock split to the four to one, we actually increase the shares outstanding by the factor four and immediately we reduce uh, the share price by the factor four. 
but we don't change here the market cap and therefore the market cap is not affected uh, by stock splits and it's actually the better metric for the total equity value of uh, the company so it's uh, a metric actually to measure the size of uh, the company so once again the share price is not a good indicator for the performance the value or the importance or the size of a stock and instead uh, we should use and uh, rely on the market capitalization thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture bye now the price and the value of a stock are two different things like in real life, so for example, when you buy a smartphone, you ask yourself whether the price is justified and whether the value or the utility that you get is worth paying the price. And uh, in financial markets, uh, this is also referred to market efficiency. So let's start uh, with uh, the difference between price and value. So stock price and stock value. And a stock's price is uh, the price that we can observe in the market. So for example, on an exchange or by data providers like Yahoo Finance. So for example, the price 150.76 for Apple. And uh, in contrast to that, so a stock's intrinsic value is a measure of what uh, the stock is actually worth. And uh, this measure can be derived by or with uh, various uh, valuation methods. And uh, in this course, uh, we will cover a couple of uh, valuation methods. But uh, most important, a stock's intrinsic value can't uh, be directly observed uh, in the market. And uh, different investors also assign different values to the very same stock. So because they have different assumptions and different views. Now, probably the most important question for trading and investing is whether the current price is greater or less uh, than uh, the intrinsic value because uh, the answer directly leads to trading and investment decisions. And uh, we actually have three cases. So case number one, uh, the price is greater than the value. And in this uh, case, uh, we can say that uh, the stock is overvalued. And uh, this is a signal to sell the stock actually. Second, uh, the value can be greater than the price. In this case, uh, the stock is undervalued and uh, we should uh, buy the stock. And last but not least, uh, the price is more or less equal to the value. And uh, this is a signal to hold or to do nothing. Now, in an efficient market, uh, the price is or should be very close to uh, the intrinsic value. And uh, the question is now, so what's the market efficiency? And uh, the market efficiency hypothesis is one of the most important concepts and theories in finance. And uh, many other theories build actually on the efficient market hypothesis or short EMH. And as uh, the name says, it is only a hypothesis and it doesn't mean that uh, it is always correct or true. And uh, like for any other hypothesis, uh, we need to find empirical evidence that either supports or rejects uh, the hypothesis. And uh, the efficient market hypothesis assumes that the financial markets are so-called information efficient. And uh, this means uh, that uh, current prices fully, quickly and uh, rationally reflect all publicly available information. And uh, there exist actually uh, three different forms of uh, the EMH. So first of all, we have uh, the weak form and uh, this includes historical pri price and volume data. So current prices fully reflect historical price and volume data. And uh, there's actually no value in historical price and volume data. And uh, for example, this means uh, that uh, technical indicators or technical analysis is uh, pretty useless. So that's at least uh, what uh, the efficient market hypothesis says. And second, uh, we have uh, the semi-strong form and uh, here also the financial statements, macroeconomics, business use, uh, analyst reports and uh, more are fully included in the current price. And as an example, if a company publicly announces an unexpected decline in profits, then uh, the share price typically and immediately reacts and drops. 
So we can say that uh, the bad news is immediately reflected and included in the price and uh, then the information itself has no value anymore. And finally we have uh, the strong form of uh, the EMH and here also private or insider information are included in prices. So this means uh, information that only the management of the company has. And here it's very important to understand uh, that in most uh, of the countries and markets, insider trading is uh, strictly prohibited by law. So managers uh, can't trade or can't use insider information to trade uh, the stock. So this is uh, the hypothesis and uh, the question is now, so what uh, do empirical studies uh, tell us about uh, the hypothesis? And uh, there do exist hundreds or even thousands of empirical studies and uh, in a nutshell. So we can say that uh, most the studies support uh, the weak form and also the semi-strong form, but uh, they do reject um, the strong form. And uh, this totally makes sense. So while traders and investors use uh, publicly available information to trade and invest, managers can't use uh, private or insider information. And therefore, typically uh, the strong form of uh, the EMH can be rejected. And therefore we can conclude uh, the following. So investors and traders typically can't make abnormal profits with uh, publicly available information because uh, those information is already included and reflected in the prices. And uh, we can also say that uh, stocks are fairly priced and uh, typically market participants say that uh, you can't beat the market. Now, as a rule of thumb, uh, we can also say that uh, developed markets are more efficient uh, than emerging markets and also large cap stocks are more efficient uh, than small cap stocks because uh, there's simply higher analyst coverage in large cap stocks. So more people use and analyze the information and uh, trade the information for large cap stocks. Now, even if uh, there's uh, evidence for the weak and uh, the semi-strong form, markets are still not perfectly efficient and uh, there are good reasons for it. And uh, we can say that uh, markets are not perfectly efficient because simply the underlying assumptions of uh, the EMH do not hold and uh, there are a couple of uh, restrictive uh, assumptions. And uh, for example, the EMH assumes uh, that all market participants have full access to all available information. And even if uh, the information is publicly available, this does not mean that all market participants uh, really search and get access to all available information and use uh, that information. And even if uh, they have uh, the full information, so this does not mean that they have uh, the skills or the capacity to process and to analyze uh, such information and uh, to draw the right conclusions. And finally, even if uh, they draw the right conclusions, market participants do not act 100% uh, rationally. And uh, there is a separate field of study, so it's called behavioral finance. And actually the GameStop stock is a recent example of irrational behavior. So at the, the beginning of the year 2021, and uh, you can see here that uh, for a long time, the stock price was around five or $10. And uh, some hedge funds believed that uh, the stock uh, was overpriced and uh, they took a short position and sold the stock. However, this uh, resulted in a 1,500% increase in the share price over the course of uh, two weeks, reaching an all-time high of 400 to 500 US dollar. And uh, this effect was mainly attributed to a coordinated action by an internet community with uh, the goal to gamble and harm the hedge fund. And uh, there seems uh, to be a second wave here at the, the end of February. So the intrinsic fair value might be somewhere here between 10 and $20 or whatsoever, but uh, many traders bought uh, the stock at a price of 200, 300 or even 400. And that's uh, simply irrational and uh, contradicts uh, the efficient market hypothesis. 
So the GameStop example is an extreme example, but uh, to sum up, as long as uh, there is a misallocation of information or insufficient skills and or irrational behavior in the market, then there will be misprice uh, instruments where prices can significantly deviate from uh, the intrinsic fair value. So the key message here is uh, that uh, price and value are two different things. However, in efficient markets, most of the time, they are closely together. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, we still have saved info with uh, tons of data for the Apple stock. And uh, for example, we can get uh, the current market capitalization. So the total value of all Apple shares which is also called uh, the market value of equity and uh, technically it is uh, the market price. However, let's assume that the uh, price and value are closely together and uh, we can get uh, the market cap here with market cap and uh, currently the market cap is 2.35 uh, trillion US dollar. Now we have learned that uh, there are two different uh, kind of uh, capital providers. So we have equity providers also called shareholders and uh, we have uh, debt providers like bondholders or banks. And actually for the equity, the book value of equity is not a good approximation for the market value. So you can find uh, the book value in the balance sheet and uh, we will cover the difference between book value and market value in one of the next lectures. But now for the debt, the book value is uh, commonly used as a good approximation for the market value of debt. And uh, we can get uh, the total debt here with uh, total debt. And uh, that's uh, the total value of all loans, bonds and other borrowings uh, of uh, the Apple company. And uh, having now the market value of equity and uh, the market value of debt, we can actually calculate uh, the firm value. So uh, the formula is as follows. So the equity value is uh, the firm value minus uh, the market value of debt. And uh, therefore here, the firm value is simply the sum of the market cap of equity and uh, the market value of debt. So here we have uh, the firm value 2.47 trillion. And actually we can also visualize this in a stacked uh, bar plot. And uh, we can see that uh, the equity is uh, higher than uh, the debt. So the total market uh, value of equity. So in our case here as uh, Apple is a financially sound uh, and a stable company, the uh, total firm value is much greater than uh, the debt. However, in financial distress or in insolvency, typically the firm value is uh, less uh, than the debt. And uh, this reminds us uh, that shareholders have only a residual claim on the total company value. So the equity is subordinated to debt. And actually we could come to the conclusion uh, that in uh, these cases here, the equity could take negative values. However, the concept of uh, limited liability is here important. So the shareholders liability is limited to already provided equity capital. And uh, there's of course no obligation to provide additional capital in uh, financial distress situations. So the equity value can't get negative and uh, typically in financial distress and insolvency, it's actually close to zero. And in these situations, so typically the debt is in default and uh, if uh, the company is getting liquidated, then typically the satisfaction is on a pro rata basis in accordance with uh, the insolvency quota. So in these cases, debt holders typically don't get 100% of uh, their capital. So only the insolvency quota, which uh, could be 50%, 10%, 5% or whatever. So this was just a little excursus here on a total company of firm value and financial distress. And once again, we shouldn't forget that uh, the equity is only a residual claim on the total company value. So it's subordinated to that. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. 
In the last lectures, we covered price and market value of equity, and uh, we learned uh, that in efficient markets, uh, they should be closely together, but uh, there is another value concept. So the book value of equity and uh, the book value is a completely different thing as uh, the book value can be found in the financial statements of a company, so in the balance sheet. So it's an accounting item and actually valuation and financial reporting or accounting are two completely different things uh, with different objectives. So valuation tries to find uh, the fair intrinsic value by making uh, partly subjective assumptions, predictions and estimations. And uh, in contrast to that, accounting or financial reporting is heavily regulated and governed uh, by the applicable accounting standards. So for example, like IFRS or US GAAP. And uh, there are clear and strict rules how to treat particular business activities and transactions in financial statements. And in the optimal case, uh, this ensures uh, that transactions are reported by firms similarly. So the buzzwords consistency, transparency, comparability, and the verifiability are the major goals of financial reporting. And uh, this allows others like investors and banks to get a fair, unbiased, and uh, more or less complete picture of a company's uh, financial conditions. So to sum up, financial reporting and accounting is not designed solely for valuation purposes. However, it does provide important inputs for valuation purposes. So typically financial statements are the starting point of any valuation. And uh, this course is clearly not about accounting and financial statements. So you could easily create a 30 hours course just on financial reporting and accounting, but at least a trader or investor should understand uh, the very basics. And in particular, the difference between market value of equity and book value of equity and once again, you can find uh, the book value of equity in uh, the financial statements. So we have here the latest balance sheet for Apple and uh, a balance sheet shows the company assets and uh, liabilities and uh, shareholder equity at a specific point in time. So for example, here on the 27th of March and uh, then before on the 26th of September. And actually, and that's probably the most important rule, so total assets uh, must equal the sum of total liabilities and shareholders' equity. So in this case here, if, uh, as we have here the numbers in millions, we have uh, 337 billion total assets and uh, the same amount of total liabilities and shareholders' equity. And uh, in a nutshell, liabilities and equity show us how the company is financed. So the financing sources and uh, the company assets show us how the company used uh, the funds. So which assets uh, they acquired to start and maintain uh, their business operations. So it's uh, the uses of the funds. And uh, finally here below, you can find uh, the shareholders equity, which is actually uh, the book value of equity. And uh, the book value of equity is uh, the residual claim of shareholders and subtracting liabilities from total assets. So we have here the formula that the total shareholders equity is equal to total assets minus the total liabilities. And now another important statement is uh, the income statement. And uh, the income statement uh, shows uh, the company's success in terms of profits and loss in a certain time period. So for example, a, a year or a quarter. So in this case, it's uh, the quarterly income statement. And in the final row here, you can find uh, the net income and uh, the net income is actually the sales. So the total revenue minus uh, the costs, including the costs of debt. So for example, interest payments and uh, the net income is actually available for equity shareholders. And uh, theoretically, the company can distribute net income as dividend. 
Now, the key message of this and the next lectures is uh, that market value and book value of equity are two completely different things. And uh, we have learned before that uh, the market value of equity is, so to say, the best estimate of uh, the fair value by the market. And if uh, the market efficiency is high, then we can say that uh, the market value of equity is uh, approximately equal to the share price times uh, the shares outstanding. So the market uh, capitalization, and in contrast to that, uh, the book value of equity is a company's owner's uh, claim after subtracting total liabilities from total assets. So it's uh, the net worth according to the balance sheet. And actually this is here the right formula. So the book value of equity is equal to the total assets minus uh, the total liabilities. So it's uh, the uh, residual claim on the total assets after deducting the total liabilities. And typically the market value and uh, the book value differ significantly, so they are not equal. And uh, the important question is now, so what are the reasons why uh, market value and book value of equity can be significantly different? And uh, just to name a few here, so typically financial statements do not include all company assets. So typically you can't find intangible assets like intellectual property. So for example, uh, know-how ideas and uh, human resources. So the people that are running the company and also trademarks, uh, brands, uh, reputations, and uh, also most important here, self-created patterns. So in most companies, intellectual property is highly valuable, but uh, you won't find uh, these values in uh, the financial statements. Another point is uh, that you won't find uh, fully depreciated assets, even if uh, they still have value. So typically there's an obligation to depreciate fixed assets like machines over a certain time period. So for example, uh, depreciating a machinery over 10 years so from the uh, historical value to zero that means uh, a 10 percent depreciation per year over 10 years and that's uh, just uh, the accounting rule now this point is related here to the last point so asset values in uh, the balance sheet do not necessarily reflect uh, the fair market values and uh, there's uh, the so-called lowest uh, value principle and uh, this principle says that uh, the value of an asset must be uh, the lower of uh, historical or amortized costs and uh, the fair value. So typically the values in a balance sheet are equal or lower than uh, the fair market values. So to sum up, uh, these points here are rather technical as set out in the financial reporting standards. But coming now to the most important and uh, non-technical reasons why uh, the book value and uh, the market value are two different concepts. So the market value is future oriented and uh, the question is how many or which profits uh, can be generated in the future. So the market value is typically derived from forecasts and estimations of future profits. And uh, in contrast to that, uh, the financial accounting, so the book value looks uh, to the past to examine financial results uh, that have already been achieved. So it's historically focused and uh, typically uh, in the balance sheet, you can find entries at historical amortized or current costs and uh, not uh, the actual value. So this was uh, the theory, but now let me just illustrate uh, the difference between market value and book value with an illustrative and uh, fictional, but uh, still realistic example. And uh, let's assume that uh, we have an experienced uh, founder team. So uh, with uh, a lot of experience and expertise in the area of uh, drones, software and artificial intelligence and uh, they are founding a new startup company to develop uh, and market drones, so the AI drones uh, company. And obviously this is a highly innovative business, so these AI drones are controlled by artificial intelligence and uh, they fly and find uh, their ways and destinations autonomously. 
So there should be a huge market and a lot of applications, so commercial applications. And uh, let's assume that uh, the founders uh, bring 4 million of uh, equity and uh, then uh, they could manage to get an extra 2 million debt from a bank. So typically it's pretty hard to finance a startup uh, with a bank loan. But uh, let's assume that uh, these founders have a reputation. So these are senior executives and uh, the success is uh, very likely here. And actually the founders uh, do not only provide a capital, so 4 million of equity, but, and maybe even more important, they bring in intellectual property, so their know-how and uh, their expertise. And uh, the company's business model is as follows. So it's a lean business model. And uh, first of all, the plan is to finalize uh, the product. So research and development and product design. And finally, also sales is actually one task here. But uh, the plan is to actually outsource uh, the manufacturing. So for example, to uh, China or India. So this means uh, that uh, the company doesn't need uh, the machinery and plant to actually build up a mass production of uh, the drones. So this is outsourced uh, to an experienced manufacturer. And uh, you could compare this business model to Apple's business model. So in the US, uh, the activities are research and development, product design and sales, but uh, Apple actually outsources uh, the production or the manufacturing to China and also India. Finally, let's have a closer look into uh, the initial balance sheet. So that's uh, the balance sheet right after founding the company. So here on the right hand side, uh, we have uh, the equity and uh, the liabilities. And uh, we have 4 million of equity and uh, 2 million debt. And uh, the company actually bought some machinery, plant and equipment to actually produce the uh, prototypes of uh, the AI drones. And uh, they also acquired some inventory and raw materials to actually build uh, the prototypes. And finally, they have uh, 3 million in cash. And uh, this is for salaries and other expenses in the first one or two years. So this is uh, the balance sheet. Pretty simple. So we have 6 million total assets. And uh, this must equal total equity and liability. So 6 million. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, we still have here the initial balance sheet. And now let's assume that uh, after one year of uh, research and development and uh, product design, the company has successfully created some patents, AI algorithms and prototypes. And now they are ready for market entry and mass production. And also the manufacturer is ready to start uh, the production of uh, the very first drones uh, that are already sold to the first customers. So there's a lot of demand and uh, pre-contracts uh, with customers for the next years. And that's uh, the very positive business situation after one year. But now let's check uh, the financial situation after one year. So the financial statements. And just to make it clear, I will demonstrate some kind of simplified pseudo accounting just uh, to keep it simple and it does not necessarily reflect specific accounting standards. And uh, let's have a look here. So this is uh, the income statement for the first year and uh, we have no sales and also zero direct cost of sales. Then we have salaries, 800,000. Then uh, we consumed half of uh, the inventories to create uh, the prototypes, so minus 500,000. And uh, we paid uh, 200,000 interest to the bank. Then we have office rent and also the mandatory depreciation of uh, the machinery and plant and then some other costs. And in total, we have here a total loss of minus 2 million US dollar. And now let's have a look how this uh, changes uh, the balance sheet. So at uh, the end of uh, the first year and uh, most important, uh, the profit and loss of uh, the income statement uh, directly increase or decrease shareholder equity. So before we had 4 million 
And now the loss of 2 million reduces uh, the equity to 2 million. So from 4 million minus 2 million to 2 million. And furthermore, machinery, plant and equipment uh, was uh, reduced by the depreciation. So minus 200k. And uh, we used half of uh, the raw materials and inventory. And now they are left 500,000. And actually the cash decreased from uh, 3 million by 1.3 million to 1.7 million. And as you can see, so the total loss is not equal to uh, the decrease in cash. So there's a difference of 700,000. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. So we have here two non-cash relevant expenses. So we have uh, the use of 500,000 of uh, the inventories. And uh, this assumes uh, that uh, we uh, didn't uh, buy new inventories. So we just consumed uh, 500,000. And also we have uh, the depreciation of uh, the machinery and plant. So once again, these two expenses are not cash relevant but it's still an expense because uh, there is a reduction of asset value here in uh, the balance sheet simply because we used or we consumed half of uh, the inventory and uh, the depreciation reflects the uh, wear and tear of uh, the machinery and plant. And once again, and that's uh, the most important rule, so total assets must equal total equity and liabilities, 4 million. Now, given the success so far with the uh, pre-sales and uh, the imminent start of the production, the company, so the management, has created uh, the following earnings forecast. So this is still the balance sheet. And here we have now the earnings forecast for the next years. So year one is uh, the past, where we had uh, a loss of 2 million. And now year two is uh, the first year in uh, the market uh, where the company effectively uh, sells uh, the drones. And uh, the company expects here a profit of 2 million. And uh, the company expects uh, a further growth. So 5 million in year 3, 10 million in year 4, and so on. So this is uh, the earnings forecast. Uh, so earnings in terms of net income available to shareholders. And now let's assume that potential buyers of uh, the company value the company at uh, a forward uh, price uh, to earnings ratio of 15. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the equity is worth uh, 15 times the income of the next year. And uh, this could be a realistic number given the projected growth here. And uh, then so the multiple here leads uh, to a market valuation of uh, 30 million. So 15 times 2 million. And in fact, this seems to be a nice investment. So paying uh, 30 million for the shares and uh, then expecting to, to generate uh, around about 50 to 60 million of net income in the next uh, five years. And uh, that's definitely okay. And uh, that will compensate for the risk that is still high at uh, this stage here. Now we have a market value of uh, the equity of uh, 30 million and uh, a book value of uh, 2 million. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the ratio is uh, 15. So the ratio of the market uh, value divided uh, by the book value. And uh, this leads to a market value to book value ratio of 15. So the market value is 15 times higher than the book value, which is a typical and even a moderate value for new high growth uh, companies. And uh, for the sake of completeness, so the ratio market value to book value is often also called uh, the price to book ratio. So that's uh, the more common term here. And actually I think uh, this little example here easily demonstrates why market value and book value can be significantly different. And uh, the major reason is uh, that the market value is actually uh, driven uh, by the future. So the question is uh, what will happen in the future? So the future profits. And in contrast to that, uh, the book value looks uh, into the past. And uh, let's recap that uh, the book value of 2 million is actually uh, the paid in capital of 4 million minus uh, the loss 
of uh, the first year 2 million. So this is what happened in the past and uh, the future is simply not uh, reflected in uh, the book value. And in this case, uh, we have here a startup uh, with no history and it's even more obvious that uh, there's hardly any link between the past and the future and therefore market value and book value of equity are two completely different things driven by different factors. So thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now there's another value concept, uh, the liquidation value. And uh, the liquidation value assumes uh, that uh, the company stops operations and goes out of business and uh, sells all company assets separately in the market. And then the sum of all sales proceeds is uh, the liquidation value, which is typically not equal to the book value of total assets in the balance sheet. And now let's just have a look at uh, our case study one more time. And uh, now we assume that after year one, there's actually no market entry because uh, research, development and product design requires more time. So for example, another year. And uh, then after the second year, it turns out that uh, the prototypes uh, don't work. And moreover, there are some legal issues and more. And uh, the founders decide to stop and to liquidate uh, the company. And uh, let's check first of all the financial situation after year two. So this is uh, the income statement for year two. And uh, the management uh, reduced its own salary. So we have minus 600K. Then they consumed uh, the remaining goods and inventories. And uh, also they paid interest for the debt. Then the office uh, ran the stable and uh, there's another depreciation of 200k for machinery and plant and uh, there are some other costs increased the costs for example for legal issues and uh, the financial result for the second year is a total loss of 2.1 million us dollar and uh, this results in the following balance sheet after year two so we had after year one 2 million equity and now the equity is getting reduced uh, by the total loss and uh, we end up uh, with a negative equity and uh, this means uh, that uh, the debt or the liabilities are greater than the total assets and a negative equity is definitely a sign that uh, the company is in financial distress and uh, that the insolvency is near but uh, the company still has some assets here so the book value for the machinery, plant and equipment are 1.6 billion. So based on historical costs uh, that are getting reduced by the depreciations, then we have zero inventory and uh, 300,000 cash. And now let's have a look at uh, the liquidation after year two. So this is once again uh, the balance sheet after year two with a negative equity. And now the following is uh, the liquidation uh, value calculation. So we assume that uh, we can sell the machinery and plant for 1 million, which is lower than uh, the book value. And uh, this is uh, pretty typical. So let's assume that we use the special and customized machines. So there's hardly any market for it. And therefore we are only able to sell the machines uh, for 1 million. But on the other hand side, uh, there are intangible assets that are not in the balance sheet. So for example, some patents that are still useful for other parties. And uh, let's assume that uh, we can sell those uh, patents for a price of 1.2 million. And uh, still we have uh, 300,000 cash. And uh, this leads us uh, to a cross liquidation value of 2.5 million. And in this case, uh, the liquidation value is greater than uh, the total assets because uh, there were some hidden reserves. So uh, the intangible assets, so the patents, were not included here in the balance sheet. But in many other cases, uh, the liquidation value can also be lower than uh, the total sum of uh, the assets here in the balance sheet. Now we have a cross liquidation value of 2.5 million. And first of all, we have to repay the bank loan, so the debt. So we have learned before that the bank is senior to the equity and therefore the bank gets back its money first. So two million 
and uh, 500 to 1000 are then left for the shareholders and uh, this is also called uh, the net liquidation value so after subtracting uh, the uh, liabilities so 500,000 so to sum up uh, the liquidation value is not necessarily equal to uh, the value of uh, the total assets in the balance sheet so the liquidation value is uh, the total worth of a company's assets if it uh, were to go out of business and its uh, asset uh, sold uh, separately. So that's uh, the liquidation value. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, let's get to the price to book ratio for two companies uh, that are completely different in terms of uh, business operations, financials, and also ratios like the price to book ratio. And uh, we still have saved info. So with uh, a lot of ratios and metrics uh, for the Apple stock, which is actually a high price to book uh, ratio stock. And uh, once again, we can get uh, the price uh, with current price and uh, the book value with book value. And then we can manually calculate uh, the price to book value ratio. So 47. And once again, this means uh, that uh, the market value of equity is uh, 47 times higher than the book value that you can find in the balance sheet. So that's uh, quite a lot. And we can also directly get uh, the price to book ratio from info with uh, price to book. And of course we have here the very same number, so 47.1. And now let's go on uh, with uh, another stock, so the General Motors stock. So General Motors is one of uh, the largest uh, car manufacturers in the US. And uh, the symbol is GM. And uh, we can directly get uh, the price to book ratio. So with uh, the uh, ticker object, get info and then price to book. And uh, here we get a price to book ratio of uh, 0.88. So it's below one. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the book value of equity is uh, greater than uh, the market value of equity. So if we deduct uh, the debt from uh, the total assets in the balance sheet, then we get uh, the book value of equity and this is higher than the market value. And investors tend to draw conclusions uh, with the ratios like the price to book ratio, which are very likely incorrect. And uh, for example, so many investors uh, view low price to book uh, values as a sign for undervaluation, which is a buy signal, or a high price to book ratio as an indicator for overvaluation, and uh, this would be a sell signal. But uh, this is too simple and in many cases just incorrect or wrong. So we should be careful with any conclusions here. And uh, just uh, to uh, name here three possible conclusions. So we not necessarily can conclude that uh, GM is uh, relatively more attractive uh, than Apple. So generally high and low price to book ratios may be justified and uh, we need uh, further analysis here. And second, as uh, the price to book ratio is below one, then uh, some investors uh, think that uh, the GM stock must be undervalued and uh, therefore is a clear buy. But also this is not correct. So there may be good reasons for the low valuation and just to name two, so low or negative profitability or low or negative growth. And finally, you could come to the conclusion that it could be more attractive for GM shareholders to cease operations and uh, sell all assets separately. So liquidation is more attractive than a going concern. This means uh, continuing the business. And also this is not necessarily correct because uh, the liquidation value is not uh, the same as uh, the book value of assets. And you simply can't uh, sell all assets of uh, GM in a timely manner and at an attractive price without uh, steep discounts. So that's impossible. And therefore, even if uh, the price to book ratio is below one, the going concern case, so continuing the operation is uh, still the more attractive case. And therefore we can conclude uh, that uh, the price to book ratio should be analyzed together with other ratios and metrics. 
So an isolated analysis of the price to book ratio is not uh, the best idea. And finally, you should uh, take into account uh, the factors that actually drive uh, the price uh, to book ratio. And uh, just uh, to name a few here, so typically the price to book ratio is higher when the profitability is high and also the higher the growth, the higher typically the price to book ratio. So these two points are clearly performance related, but uh, there are other factors that are more specific uh, to companies or industries. So it uh, really depends on the sector or industry. And uh, there's a clear difference between uh, service or IT companies and uh, manufacturing companies. So typically manufacturing companies like GM have a high asset or capital intensity. So they need a lot of plant and machinery and therefore by nature the price to book ratio is lower than for example for a service or IT company like uh, Google or Facebook. So the higher the asset or capital intensity, the lower the price to book ratio. And also operational business decisions do matter. So if a company outsources the manufacturing like Apple does, then uh, this should increase uh, the price to book ratio because machinery and plant are not on uh, the balance sheet if uh, you outsource uh, manufacturing. And finally, also financing uh, decisions can influence uh, the price to book uh, ratio. So if you have a lot of off balance sheet financing like leasing, then uh, this also should increase uh, the price uh, to book ratio. So for example, the leasing of uh, the office building. So to sum up uh, the key messages uh, that uh, you should be careful when comparing apples and oranges, with uh, the price uh, to book ratio. So it really depends on uh, the specific companies and uh, maybe also sectors and industries. And a lower price to book ratio does not necessarily mean that a stock is more attractive or undervalued or whatever. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. We have learned before that on Yahoo Finance, we can also find financial statements like the balance sheet, uh, the income statement or the cash flow statement. And now it's no surprise uh, that we can load the statements into Python with uh, the Yahoo Finance API. And uh, let me just demonstrate how this works. So we still have saved here the Apple ticker object, and then we can get uh, the balance sheet. So uh, the latest annual balance sheet with uh, the method get balance sheet and uh, we take actually the positions in million US dollars so we divide by 1 million and then we save uh, the balance sheet data frame in BS and uh, here we have uh, the positions so for example total stockholder equity and uh, total liabilities and here we have annual balance sheets so starting in 2019, 20, 21, and uh, 22. And actually here we can see actually uh, the reporting dates. So it's uh, end of uh, September. And uh, we can conclude here that uh, for Apple, the financial year is uh, from October till the end of uh, September next year. So that's uh, the financial year. And at a first glance, you might see here that uh, the balance sheet is kind of unsorted and uh, you need to bring it into the right or most appropriate order. So let's compare this uh, with uh, the balance sheet provided uh, on the uh, Apple website. So typically uh, the organization of a balance sheet is as follows. So first we have assets and uh, starting with current assets so then non-current assets. And then we have liabilities and shareholders equity. So current liabilities, non-current liabilities and uh, shareholders equity and uh, you have to actually uh, reorganize here the order a little bit but that's beyond uh, the scope of uh, this lecture or this section and uh, anyway financial statement analysis is not uh, the major focus here in this course as it requires a solid understanding of accounting and accounting standards and as Yahoo Finance provides the ratios and metrics taken from uh, these statements anyway, so for example, the price to book ratio, 
there's actually no need to do this on our own. But uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, now you know how you can get, for example, the balance sheet uh, from Yahoo Finance. And uh, you can also get uh, the income statement with uh, the method get financials also here in million US dollar. And also here the data frame needs to be sorted. So actually net income should be uh, the last uh, row here. And here for comparison purposes, you can see the income statement taken from the Apple website. And also here for the income statement, uh, we can see that uh, we have annual data. So the annual income statement also uh, as of end of September. And uh, finally, we can also get uh, the cash flow statement. So with get cash flow. And also here we have annual data. And uh, there's also the option to get uh, quarterly statements with the quarterly balance sheet. And here you get uh, the last four quarters. So ending in September, June, March, and uh, December. And uh, the same also for the income statements. So quarterly income statements. And also the quarterly cash flow statement. And uh, with uh, this, we have reached uh, the end of uh, this uh, video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.